Blue Horizon by Wilbur Smith This book is for my wife, Mokiniso. Our first three years together have been enchantment. I look forward eagerly to the next thirty. The three stood at the very edge of the sea and watched the moon laying a pathway of shimmering iridescence across the dark waters. Full of the moon in two days, Jim Courtney said confidently. The big reds will be hungry as lions. A wave came sliding up the beach and foamed around his ankles. Let's get her launched instead of standing here jabbering, his cousin Mansur Courtney suggested. His hair shone like newly minted copper in the moonlight, his smile sparkling as brightly. Lightly he elbowed the black youth who stood beside him, wearing only a white loincloth. Come on, Zama! They bent to it together. The small craft slid forward reluctantly, and they heaved again, but this time it stuck fast in the wet sand. Wait for the next big one! Jim ordered, and they gathered themselves. Here it comes! The swell humped up far out, then raced towards them, gathering height. It burst white on the brake line, then creamed in, throwing the bows of the skiff high and making them stagger with its power. They had to cling to the gunwale with the water swirling waist-high around them. Together now! Jim yelled, and they threw their combined weight on the boat. Run with her! She came unstuck and rode free, and they used the backwash of the wave to take her out until they were shoulder-deep. "'Get on the oars!' Jim spluttered as the next wave broke over his head. They reached up, grabbed the side of the skiff, and hauled themselves on board, the seawater running off them. Laughing with excitement, they seized the long oars that were lying ready and thrust them between the thole pins. "'Heave away!' The oars bit, swung, and came clear— dripping with silver in the moonlight, leaving tiny luminous whirlpools on the surface. The skiff danced clear out of the turbulent brake line, and they fell into the easy rhythm of long practice. "'Which way?' Mansa asked. Both he and Zama looked naturally to Jim for the decision. Jim was always the leader. "'The cauldron,' Jim said with finality. "'Ha! <laughs> I thought so,' Mansa laughed. You still got a grudge against Big Julie? Zama spat over the side without missing a stroke. Have a care somewhere. Big Julie still has a grudge against you, Zama spoke in Lotzi, his native tongue. Samoya meant wild wind. It was the name that Jim had been given in childhood for his temper. Jim scowled at the memory. None of them had ever laid eyes on the fish they had named Big Julie, but they knew it was a hen, not a cock, because only the female grew to such size and power. They had felt her power transferred from the depths through the straining cod line. The seawater squirted out of the weave and smoked as it sped out over the gunwale, cutting a deep furrow in the hardwood as blood dripped from their torn hands. In 1715 my father was on the old maid of Oman when she went aground at Danger Point, Mansur said in Arabic, his mother's language. The mate tried to swim ashore to carry a line through the surf, and a big red steenbrass came up under him when he was halfway across. The water was so clear they could see it coming up from three fathoms down. It bit off the mate's left leg above the knee and swallowed it in a gulp, like a dog with a chicken wing. The mate was screaming and beating the water, all frothed up with his own blood, trying to scare the fish off, but it circled under him and took the other leg. Then it pulled him under and took him deep. They never saw him again. "'You tell that story every time I want to go to the cauldron,' Jim grunted darkly. "'And every time it scares seven different colours of dung out of you,' said Zama in English. The three had spent so much time together that they were fluent in each other's language, English, Arabic, and Lotzi. They switched between them effortlessly. Jim laughed, more to relieve his feelings than from amusement. <laughs> Where, pray, did you learn that disgusting expression, you heathen? Zama grinned. From your exalted father, he retorted. And for once Jim had no answer. Instead, he looked to the lightning horizon. Sunrise in two hours. I want to be over the cauldron before then. That's the best time for another tilt at Julie. 
they pulled out into the heart of the bay, riding the long cape swells that came marching in unfettered ranks from their long journey across the southern Atlantic. With the wind full into the bows, they could not hoist the single sail. Behind them rose the moonlit massif of Table Mountain, flat-topped and majestic. There was a dark agglomeration of shipping lying close in below the mountain, riding at anchor, most of the great ships with their yards down. This anchorage was the caravanserai of the southern seas, the trading vessels and warships of the Dutch East India Company, the VOC, and those of half a dozen other nations used the Cape of Good Hope to victual and refit after their long ocean passages. At this early hour few lights showed on the shore, only dim lanterns on the walls of the castle, and in the windows of the beachfront taverns where the crews off the ships in the bay were still revelling. Jim's eyes went naturally to a single prick of light, separated by over a sea mile of darkness from the others. That was the go-down and office of the Courtney Brothers Trading Company, and he knew the light shone from the window of his father's office on the second floor of the sprawling warehouse. Ha-ha! <laughs> Papa is counting the shekels again! he laughed to himself. Tom Courtney, Jim's father, was one of the most successful traders at Good Hope. "'There's the island coming up,' Mansur said, and Jim's attention came back to the work ahead. He adjusted the tiller rope, which was wrapped around the big toe of his bare right foot. They altered course slightly to port, heading for the north point of Robben Island. "'Robben!' was the Dutch word for the seals that swarmed over the rocky outcrop. Already they could smell the animals on the night air. The stench of their fish-laden dung was chokingly powerful. Closer in, Jim stood up on the thwart to get his bearing from the shore, checking the landmarks that would enable him to place the skiff accurately over the deep hole they had named the cauldron. Suddenly he shouted with alarm and dropped back onto the thwart, Look at this great oaf! He's going to run us down! Pull, damn you, pull! A tall ship flying a great mass of canvas had come silently and swiftly around the north point of the island. Driven on the northwester, it was bearing down on them with terrifying speed. Bloody cheese-headed Dutchman, Jim swore as he heaved on the long oar. Murderous, landlubbing son of a tavern whore! He's not even showing a light! "'And where, pray, did you learn such language?' Mansur panted between desperate strokes. "'You're as big a clown as a stupid Dutchman,' Jim told him grimly. The ship loomed over them, her bow waved shining silver in the moonlight. "'Hail her!' There was a sudden edge to Mansur's voice as the danger became even more apparent. Eh, "'Don't waste your breath,' Zama retorted. "'They're fast asleep. They won't hear you. Pull!' The three strained on the oars, and the little vessel seemed to fly through the water, but the big ship came on even faster. "'We will have to jump?' There was a question in Mansur's strained tone. "'Good!' Jim grunted. "'We're right over the cauldron. Test your father's story. Which of your legs will Big Julie bite off first? They rowed in a silent frenzy, sweat bursting out and shining on their contorted faces in the cool night. They were heading for the safety of the rocks, where the big ship could not touch them, but they were still a full cable's length out, and now the high sails towered over them, blotting out the stars. They could hear the wind drumming in the canvas, the creaking of her timbers, and the musical burble of her bow wave. Not one of the boys spoke as they strained on the oars. They stared up at her in dread. "'Sweet Jesus, spare us,' Jim whispered. "'In Allah's name,' Mansur said softly, "'all the fathers of my tribe!' Each called out to his own god or gods. Zama never missed the stroke, but his eyes glared white in his dark face as he watched death bear down on them. The pressure wave ahead of the bows lifted them, and suddenly they were surfing on it, flung backwards, racing stern first down the side of the wave. The transom went under, and icy water poured in, flooding her. All three boys were hurled over the side, just as the massive howl hit them. As he went under, Jim realised that it had been a glancing blow. The skiff was hurled aside, but there was no crack of rending timbers. Jim was driven deep, but he tried to swim deeper still. He knew that contact with the bottom of the ship would be fatal. She would be heavily encrusted with barnacles from her ocean passage, and the razor-sharp shells would strip the flesh from his bones. 
He tensed every muscle in his body in anticipation of the agony. But it did not come. His lungs were burning and his chest was pumping with the compelling urge to breathe. He fought it until he was sure that the ship was clear, then turned for the surface and drove upwards with arms and legs. He saw the golden outline of the moon through limpid water, wavering and insubstantial, and swam towards it with all his strength and will. Suddenly he burst out into the air and filled his lungs with it. He rolled onto his back, gasped, choked, and sucked in the life-giving sweetness. Mansa! Zama! he croaked through the pain of his aching lungs. Where are you? Pipe up, damn you! Let me hear you! Here! Yeah! It was Mansa's voice, and Jim looked for him. His cousin was clinging to the swamped skiff, his long red curls slicked down over his face like a seal's pelt. Just then, another head popped through the surface between them. Zama! With two overarm strokes he reached them and lifted his face out of the water. Zama coughed and brought up an explosive jet of seawater and vomit. He tried to throw both arms around Jim's neck, but Jim ducked him until he released his grip, then dragged him to the side of the wallowing skiff. Here, take hold of this! He guided his hand to the gunwale. The three hung there, struggling for breath. Jim was the first to recover sufficiently to find his anger again. Bitch-born Bastard! he gasped as he stared after the departing ship. She was sailing on sedately. Doesn't even know he almost killed us. She stinks worse than the seal colony, Mansur's voice was still rough, and the effort of speech brought on a coughing fit. Jim sniffed the air and caught the odour that fouled it. Slaver! Bloody slaver! he spat, no mistaking that smell. Or a convict ship! Manzer said hoarsely, probably transporting prisoners from Amsterdam to Batavia. They watched the ship alter course, her sails changing shape in the moonlight as she rounded up to enter the bay and join the other shipping anchored there. I'd like to find her captain in one of the gin hells at the docks, Jim said darkly. Ah, forget it, Manzer advised him. He'd stick a knife between your ribs or in some other painful place. Let's get the skiff bailed out. There was only a few fingers of freeboard, so Jim had to slide in over the transom. He groped under the thwart and found the wooden bucket still lashed under the seat. They had tied down all the gear and equipment securely for the hazardous launch through the surf. He began bailing out the hull, sending a steady stream of water over the side. By the time it was half cleared, Zama had recovered sufficiently to climb aboard and take a spell with the bucket. Jim hauled in the oars, which were still floating alongside, then checked the other equipment. "'All the fishing tackle's still here,' he opened the mouth of a sack and peered inside. "'Even the bait!' "'Are we going on?' Mansur asked. "'Of course we are. Why not, in the name of the devil?' "'Well,' Mansur looked dubious, "'we were nearly drowned.' "'But we weren't,' Jim pointed out briskly. Zama's got her dry and the cauldron is less than a cable's length away. Big Julie is waiting for her breakfast. Let's go and feed it to her. Once again they took their positions on the thwarts and plied the long oars. Bastard cheesehead cost us an hour's fishing time, Jim complained bitterly. It could have cost you a lot more, Samoya, Zama laughed, if I hadn't been there to pull you out. Jim picked up a dead fish from the bait bag and threw it at his head. They were swiftly recovering their high spirits and camaraderie. Hold the stroke, we're coming up on the marks now, Jim warned. And they began the delicate business of manoeuvring the skiff into position over the rocky hole in the green depths below them. They had to drop the anchor onto the ledge to the south of the cauldron, then let the current drift them back over the deep subterranean canyon. The swirling current that gave the place its name complicated their work, and twice they missed the marks. With much sweat and swearing, they had to retrieve the fifty-pound boulder that was their anchor and try again. The dawn was sneaking in from the east, stealthily as a thief, before Jim plumbed the depth with an unbaited cod line to make certain they were in the perfect position. He measured the line between the span of his open arms as it streamed over the side. Thirty-three fathoms!' he exclaimed, as he felt the lead sinker bump the bottom. "'Nearly two hundred feet!' We're right over Big Julie's dining room. 
he brought up the sinker swiftly with a swinging double-handed action. Bait up, boys! There was a scramble for the bait bag. Jim reached in, and from under Manso's fingers he snatched the choicest bait of all, a grey mullet as long as his forearm. He had netted it the previous day in the lagoon below the company go-down. "'That's too good for you,' he explained reasonably. "'Needs a real fisherman to handle, Julie.' He threaded the point of the steel shark hook through the mullet's eye sockets. The bite of the hook was two hand spans across. Jim shook out the leader. It was ten feet of steel chain, light but strong. Alf, his father's blacksmith, had hand-forged it especially for him. Jim was certain it would resist the efforts of even a great king steambrass to share it against the reef. He swung the bait around his head, letting the heavy cod line pay out with each swing, until at last he released it and sent it with the chain leader to streak far out across the green surface. As the bait sank into the depths, he let the line stream after it. Right down Big Julie's throat, he gloated. This time she isn't going to get away. This time she's mine. When he felt the lead sinker hit the bottom, he laid out a coil of the line on the deck and stood firmly on it with his bare right foot. He needed both hands on the oar to counter the current and keep the skiff on station above the cauldron with the heavy line running straight up and down. Zama and Mansa were fishing with lighter hooks and lines, using small chunks of mackerel as bait. Almost immediately they were hauling in fish. Rosy red stump nose, wriggling silvery bream, spotted tigers that grunted like piglets as the boys twisted out the hook and threw them into the bilges. Baby fish for little boys, Jim mocked them. Diligently he tendered his own heavy line, rowing quietly to hold the skiff steady across the current. The sun rose clear of the horizon and took the chill out of the air. The three stripped off their outer clothing until they were clad only in breech clouts. Close at hand, the seals swarmed over the rocks of the island, dived and roiled close around the anchored skiff. Suddenly a big dog seal dived under the boat and seized the fish Mansa was bringing up, tore it from the hook and surfaced yards away with it in its jaws. Abomination! Curse of God! Mansa shouted in outrage as the seal held the plundered fish on its chest and tore off hunks of flesh with gleaming fangs. Jim dropped the oar and reached into his tackle bag. He brought out his slingshot and fitted a water-worn pebble into the pouch. He had selected his ammunition from the bed of the stream at the north end of the estate, and each stone was round, smooth, and perfectly weighted. Jim had practised with the slingshot until he could bring down a high-flying goose with four throws out of five. He wound up for the throw, swinging the slingshot overhead until it hummed with power. Then he released it, and the pebble blurred from the pouch. It caught the dog seal in the centre of its rounded black skull, and they heard the fragile bone shatter. The animal died instantly, and its carcass drifted away on the current, twitching convulsively. "'He won't be stealing any more fish,' Jim stuffed the slingshot back in the bag. "'And the others will have learned a lesson in manners.' The rest of the seal pack sheared away from the skiff. Jim took up the oar again, and they resumed their interrupted conversation. Only the previous week Mansa had returned on one of the Courtney ships from a trading voyage up the east coast of Africa as far as the Horn of Hormuz. He was describing to them the wonders he had seen and the marvellous adventures he had shared with his father, who had captained the gift of Allah. Mansa's father, Dorian Courtney, was the other partner in the company. In his extreme youth he had been captured by Arabian pirates and sold to a prince of Oman who had adopted him and converted him to Islam. His half-brother, Tom Courtney, was Christian, while Dorian was Muslim. When Tom had found and rescued his younger brother, they had made a happy partnership. Between them they had entry to both religious worlds, and their enterprise had flourished. Over the last twenty years they had traded in India, Arabia and Africa, and sold their exotic goods in Europe. As Mansir spoke, Jim watched his cousin's face, and once again he envied his beauty and his charm. Mansir had inherited it from his father, along with the red-gold hair that hung thickly down his back. 
Like Dorian, he was lithe and quick, while Jim took after his own father, broad and strong. Zama's father, Aboli, had compared them to the bull and the gazelle. Come on, cuz, Mansair broke off his tail to tease Jim. Zama and I will have the boat filled to the gunnels before you've even woken up. Catch us a fish. I've always prized quality above mere quantity, Jim retorted in a pitying tone. Well, you've nothing better to do, so you can tell us about your journey to the land of the Hottentots. Mansur swung another gleaming, flapping fish over the side of the skiff. Jim's plain, honest face lit up with pleasure at the memory of his own adventure. Instinctively, he looked northwards across the bay at the rugged mountains, which the morning sun was painting with brightest gold. We travelled for thirty-eight days, he boasted, north across the mountains and the great desert, far beyond the frontiers of this colony, which the Governor and the Council of the VOC in Amsterdam have forbidden any man to cross. We trekked into lands where no white man has been before us. He did not have the fluency or the poetic descriptive powers of his cousin, but his enthusiasm was contagious. Mansur and Zama laughed with him as he described the barbaric tribes they had encountered and the endless herds of wild game spread across the plains. At intervals he appealed to Zama. It's true what I say, isn't it, Zama? You were with me. Tell Mansur it's true. Zama nodded solemnly. It is true. I swear it on the grave of my own father. Every word is true. One day I'll go back. Jim made the promise to himself, rather than to the others. I will go back and cross the blue horizon to the very limit of this land. And I will go with you, Samoya. Zama looked at him with complete trust and affection. Zama remembered what his own father had said of Jim when at last he lay dying on his sleeping carosse, burnt out with age, a ruined giant whose strength had seemed once to hold the very sky suspended. Jim Courtney is the true son of his father, Abberley had whispered. Cleave to him as I have to Tom. You will never regret it, my son. I will go with you, Zama repeated, and Jim winked at him. Of course you will, you old rogue. Nobody else would have you. He clapped Zama on the back so hard he almost knocked him off the thwart. He would have said more, but at that moment the coil of codline jerked under his foot, and he let out a triumphant shout. Julie knocks at the door! Come in, big Julie! He dropped the oar and snatched up the line. He held it strung between both his hands with a slack bite ready to feed out over the side. Without being ordered to do so, the other two retrieved their own rigs, stripping the line in over the gunwale, hand over hand, working with feverish speed. They knew how vital it was to give Jim open water in which to work with a truly big fish. "'Come, my prittling!' Jim whispered to the fish as he held the line delicately between thumb and finger. He could feel nothing, just the soft press of the current. "'Come, my darling! Papa loves you!' he pleaded. Then he felt a new pressure on the line, a gentle, almost furtive movement. Every nerve in his body jerked, bowstring taut. She's there. She's still there. The line went slack again. Don't leave me, sweetest heart. Please don't leave me. Jim leaned out over the side of the skiff, holding the line high so that it ran straight from his fingers into the green swirl of the waters. The others watched without daring to draw breath. Then suddenly they saw his raised right hand drawn down irresistibly by some massive weight. They watched the muscles in his arms and back coil and bunch like an adder preparing to strike, and neither spoke or moved as the hand holding the line almost touched the surface of the sea. Yes, said Jim quietly. Now! He reared back with the weight of his body behind the strike. Yes, and yes, and yes! Each time he said it, he heaved back on the line, swinging with alternate arms right, left, and right again. There was no give even to Jim's strength. That can't be a fish, said Mansur. No fish is that strong. You must have hooked the bottom. Jim did not answer him. Now he was leaning back with all his weight, his knees jammed against the wooden gunwale to give himself full purchase. His teeth were gritted, his face turned puce, and his eyes seemed to bulge from their sockets. Tail onto the line, he gasped. 
and the other two scrambled down the deck to help him. But before they reached the stern, Jim was jerked off his feet and sprawled against the side of the boat. The line raced through his fingers, and they could smell the skin burning like mutton ribs grilling on the coals as it tore from his palm. Jim yelled with pain, but held on grimly. With a mighty effort, he managed to get the line across the edge of the gunwale and tried to jam it there, but he lost more skin as his knuckles slammed into the wood. With one hand, he snatched off his cap to use as a glove while he held the line against the wood. All three were yelling like demons in hellfire. Give me a hand! Grab the end! Let him run! You'll straighten the hook! Get the bucket! Throw water on it! The line will burst into flames! Zama managed to get both hands on the line, but even with their combined strength they could not stop the run of the great fish. The line hissed with the strain as it raced over the side, and they could feel the sweep of the great tail pulsing through it. Water, for the love of Christ, wet it down, Jim howled, and Mansur scooped a bucketful from alongside and dashed it over their hands and the sizzling line. There was a puff of steam as the water boiled off. By God, we've almost lost all of this coil, Jim shouted, as he saw the end of the line in the bottom of the wooden tub that held it. Quick as you can, Mansur, tie on another coil. Mansur worked quickly, with the dexterity for which he was renowned, but he was only just in time. As he tightened the knot, the rope was jerked from his grasp and pulled through the fingers of the other two, ripping off more skin before it went over the side and down into the green depths. Stop! Jim pleaded with the fish. Are you trying to kill us, Julie? Will you not stop, my beauty? That's half the second coil gone already, Mansur warned them. Let me take over from you, Jim. There's blood all over the deck. No, no, no. Jim shook his head vehemently. She's slowing down. Heart's almost broken. Yours or hers? Mansur asked. Go on the stage, cuz, Jim advised him grimly. Your wit is wasted here. The running line began to slow as it passed through their torn fingers. Then it stopped. Leave the water bucket, Jim ordered. Get a grip on the line. Mansur hung on behind Zama and with the extra weight Jim could let go with one hand and suck his fingers. "'Do we do this for fun?' he asked wonderingly. Then his voice became businesslike. "'Now it's our turn, Julie.' Keeping pressure on the line while they moved, they rearranged themselves down the length of the deck, standing nose to tail, bent double with the line passed back between their legs. "'One, two, and a tiger!' Jim gave them the timing and they heaved the line in, swinging their weight on it together. The knotted joint came back in over the side, and Mansair, as third man, coiled the line back into the tub. Four times more the great fish gathered its strength and streaked away, and they were forced to let it take out line, but each time the run was shorter. Then they turned its head and brought it back, struggling and jolting, its strength slowly waning. Suddenly Jim at the head of the line gave a shout of joy, "'There she is! I can see her down there!' The fish turned in a wide circle deep below the hull. As she came round, her bronze-red side caught the sunlight and flashed like a mirror. "'Sweet Jesus, she's beautiful!' Jim could see the fish's huge golden eye staring up at him through the emerald-coloured water. The steen brass's mouth opened and closed spasmodically, the gill plates flaring as they pumped water through, starving for oxygen. Those jaws were cavernous enough to take in a grown man's head and shoulders, and they were lined with serried ranks of fangs as long and thick as his forefinger. "'Now I believe Uncle Dory's tail,' Jim gasped with the exertion. "'Those teeth could easily bite off a man's leg.' At last, almost two hours after Jim had first set the hook in the hinge of the fish's jaw, they had it alongside the skiff. Between them they lifted the gigantic head clear of the water. As soon as they did so, the fish went into its last frenzy. Its body was half as long again as a tall man, and as thick around the middle as a Shetland pony. It pulsed and flexed until its nose touched the wide flukes of its tail, first on the one side, then on the other. It threw up sheets of seawater that came aboard in solid gouts, drenching the three lads as though they stood under a waterfall. They held on grimly until the violent paroxysms weakened. Then Jim called out, "'Hang on to her! She's ready for the priest!' He snatched up the billy from its sling under the transom. The end of the club was weighted with lead, 
balanced and heavy in his big right hand. He lifted the fish's head high and swung his weight behind the blow. It caught the fish across the bony ridge above those glaring yellow eyes. The massive body stiffened in death and violent tremors ran down its shimmering, sun-red flanks. Then the life went out of it, and white belly uppermost, it floated alongside the skiff with its gill plates open wide as a lady's parasol. Drenched with sweat and sea water, panting wildly, nursing their torn hands, they leaned on the transom and gazed in awe upon the marvellous creature they had killed. There were no words to express adequately the overpowering emotions of triumph and remorse, of jubilation and melancholy, that gripped them now that the ultimate passion of the hunter had come to its climax. "'In the name of the prophet, this is Leviathan indeed,' Mansur said softly. "'He makes me feel so small.' "'The sharks will be here any minute,' Jim broke the spell. "'Help me get her on board.' They threaded the rope through the fish's gills, then all three hauled on it, the skiff listing dangerously close to the point of capsizing as they brought it over the side. The boat was barely large enough to contain its bulk, and there was no room for them to sit on the thwarts, so they perched on the gunwale. A scale had been torn off as the fish slid over the side. It was the size of a golden doubloon, and as bright. Mansa picked it up and turned it to catch the sunlight, staring at it with fascination. "'We must take this fish home to High Weald,' he said. "'Why?' Jim asked brusquely. "'To show the family, my father and yours. "'By nightfall he will lost his colour, "'his scales will be dry and dull, "'and his flesh will start to rot and stink,' Jim shook his head. "'I want to remember him like this, in all his glory. "'What are you going to do with him, then?' "'Sell him to the purser of the VOC ship. "'Such a wonderful creature!' "'Sell him like a sack of potatoes? "'That seems like sacrilege,' Mansur protested. "'I give you of the beasts of the earth and the fish of the sea. "'Kill, eat,' Jim quoted. "'Genesis, God's very words. "'How could it be sacrilege?' "'Your God, not mine,' Mansur contradicted him. "'He's the same God, yours and mine. "'We just call him different names. "'He is my God also.' Zama was not to be left out. Kulu Kulu, the greatest of the great ones. Jim wrapped a strip of cloth around his injured hand. In the name of Kulu Kulu, then, the Stian Brass is the means to get aboard the Dutch ship. I'm going to use it as a letter of introduction to the purser. It's not just one fish I'm going to sell him, it's all the produce from High Weald. With the northwesterly breeze blowing ten knots behind them, they could hoist the single sail, which carried them swiftly into the bay. There were eight ships lying at anchor, under the guns of the castle. Most had been there for weeks and were already well provisioned. Jim pointed out the latest arrival. They will not have set foot on land for months. They'll be famished for fresh food. They're probably riddled with scurvy already. Jim put the tiller over and wove through the anchored shipping. After what they almost did to us, they owe us a nice bit of profit. All the Courtenays were traders to the core of their being, and for even the youngest of them the word profit held almost religious significance. Jim headed for the Dutch ship. It was a tall three-decker, twenty guns aside, square-rigged, three masts, big and beamy, obviously an armed trader. She flew the VOC pennant and the flag of the Dutch Republic. As they closed with her, Jim could see the storm damage to hull and rigging. Clearly she had endured a rough passage. Closer still, Jim could make out the ship's name on her stern in faded gilt lettering. Het gelukkige Mew, the lucky seagull. He grinned at how inappropriately the shabby old lady had been named. Then his green eyes narrowed with surprise and interest. Women, by God, he pointed ahead, hundreds of them. Both Mansur and Zama scrambled to their feet, clung to the mast, and peered ahead, shading their eyes against the sun. "'You're right!' Mansur exclaimed. Apart from the wives of the burghers, their stolid, heavily chaperoned daughters, and the trollops of the waterfront taverns, women were rare at the Cape of Good Hope. "'Look at them!' Jim breathed with awe. "'Just look at those beauties!' 
Forward of the mainmast, the deck was crowded with female shapes. "'How do you know they're beautiful?' Mansir demanded. "'We're too far away to tell. They're probably ugly old crones.' "'No, God could not be so cruel to us,' Jim laughed excitedly. <laughs> "'Every one of them is an angel from heaven, I just know it.' There was a small group of officers on the quarter-deck, and knots of seamen were already at work repairing the damaged rigging and painting the hull. But the three youths in the skiff had eyes only for the female shapes on the foredeck. Once again they caught a whiff of the stench that hung over the ship, and Jim exclaimed with horror, "'They're in leg irons!' He had the sharpest eyesight of the three, and had seen that the ranks of women were shuffling along the deck in single file, with the hampered gait of the chained captive. "'Convicts!' Mansur agreed. "'Your angels from heaven are female convicts, uglier than sin!' They were close enough now to make out the features of some of the bedraggled creatures, the grey, greasy hair, the toothless mouths, the wrinkled pallor of ancient skin, the sunken eyes, and, on most of the miserable faces, the ugly blotches and bruises of scurvy. They stared down on the approaching boat with dull, hopeless eyes, showing no interest, no emotion of any kind. Even Jim's lascivious instincts were cooled. These were no longer human beings, but beaten, abused animals. Their coarse canvas shifts were ragged and soiled. Obviously they had worn them ever since leaving Amsterdam, without water to wash their bodies, let alone their clothing. There were guards armed with muskets stationed in the mainmast bits, and the forecastle overlooking the deck. As the skiff came within hail, a petty officer in a blue pea-jacket hurried to the ship's side and raised a speaking trumpet to his lips. "'Stand clear!' he shouted in Dutch. "'This is a prison ship. Stand off, or we will fire into you.' "'He means it, Jim,' Mansur said. "'Let's get away from her.' Jim ignored the suggestion and held up one of the fish. "'Farsfis!' "'Fresh fish!' he yelled back. "'Straight out of the sea! Caught an hour ago!' The man at the rail hesitated, and Jim sensed his opportunity. "'Look at this one!' he pointed at the huge carcass that filled most of the skiff. "'Stienbras! Finest eating fish in the sea! There's enough here to feed every man on board for a week!' "'Wait!' the man yelled back and hurried across the deck to the group of officers. There was a brief discussion. Then he came back to the rail. "'Good, then, come, but keep clear of our bows. "'Who come to the stern chains?' "'Mansir dropped the tiny sail, and they rowed under the side of the ship. Three seamen stood at the rail, aiming their muskets down into the skiff. "'Don't try anything clever,' the petty officer warned them, "'unless you want a ball in your belly.' "'Jim grinned up at him ingratiatingly and showed his empty hands. "'We mean no harm, Mynheer. We are honest fishermen.' He was still fascinated by the lines of chained women, and stared up at them with revulsion and pity as they shuffled in a sorry line along the near rail. Then he switched his attention to bringing the skiff alongside. He did this with a seaman-like flourish, and Zama tossed the painter up to a seaman who was waiting in the chains above them. The ship's purser, a plump, bald man, stuck his head over the side and peered down into the skiff to inspect the wares on offer. He looked impressed by the size of the giant Stienbras carcass. "'I am not going to shout. Come up here where we can talk,' the purser invited Jim and ordered a seaman to drop a rope ladder over the side. This was the invitation Jim had been angling for. He shinned up and over the high tumble home of the ship's side like an acrobat and landed on the deck beside the purser with a slap of his bare feet. "'How much for the big one?' the purser's question was ambiguous and he ran a pederast's calculating glance over Jim's body. A fine bit of beef, he thought, as he studied the muscled chest and arms and the long, shapely legs, smooth and tanned by the sun. Fifteen silver guilders for the entire load of our fish, Jim placed emphasis on the last word. The purser's interest in him was obvious. Are you an escaped lunatic? the purser retorted. You, your fish, and your dirty little boat together are not worth half that much. The boat and I are not for sale, Jim assured him with relish. When he was bargaining, he was in his element. His father had trained him well. 
he had no compunction in taking advantage of the purser's sexual predilections to push him for the best price. They settled on eight guilders for the full load. "'I want to keep the smallest fish for my family's dinner,' Jim said, and the purser chuckled. "'You drive a hard bargain, Carol. he spat on his right hand and proffered it. Jim spat on his own, and they shook hands to seal the bargain. The purser held on to Jim's hand for a little longer than was necessary. "'What else have you got for sale, young stallion?' he winked at Jim, and ran his tongue round his fat, sun-cracked lips. Jim did not answer him at once, but went to the rail to watch the crew of Hetgelukhamu lower a cargo net into the skiff. With difficulty, Mansur and Zama slid the huge fish into it, then it was hoisted up and swung onto the deck. Jim turned back to the purser. I can sell you a load of fresh vegetables, potatoes, onions, pumpkins, fruit, anything you want, at half the price they will charge you if you buy from the company gardens, Jim told him. You know full well that the VOC has the monopoly, the purser demurred. I am forbidden to buy from private traders. I can fix that with a few guilders in the right pocket. Jim touched the side of his nose. Everyone knew how simple it was to placate the company officials at Good Hope. Corruption was a way of life in the colonies. Very well, then. Bring me out a load of the best you have, the purser agreed, and laid an avuncular hand on Jim's arm. But don't get caught at it. We don't want a pretty boy like you all cut up with the lash. Jim evaded his touch without making it obvious. Never upset a customer. There was a sudden commotion on the foredeck, and grateful for the respite from these plump and sweaty attentions, Jim glanced over his shoulder. The first group of women prisoners was being herded down below decks, and another line was coming up into the open air for their exercise. Jim stared at the girl at the head of this new file of prisoners. His breath came short, and his pulse pounded in his ears. She was tall, but starved thin and pale, she wore a shift of threadbare canvas with a hem so tattered that her knees showed through the holes. Her legs were thin and bony, the flesh melted off by starvation, and her arms were the same. Under the shapeless canvas her body seemed boyish, lacking the swells and round contours of a woman. But Jim was not looking at her body. He was gazing at her face. Her head was small but gracefully poised on her long neck, like an unopened tulip on its stem. Her skin was pale and flawless, so fine in texture that he imagined he could see her cheekbones through it. Even in her terrible circumstances, she had clearly made an effort to prevent herself sinking into the slough of despair. Her hair was pulled back from her face, plaited into a thick rope that hung forward over one shoulder, and she had contrived somehow to keep it clean and combed. It reached down almost to her waist, fine as spun Chinese silk, and blonde, dazzling as a golden guinea in the sunlight. But it was her eyes that stopped Jim's breath altogether for a long minute. They were blue, the colour of the high African sky in midsummer. When she looked upon him for the first time, they opened wide. Then her lips parted and her teeth were white and even, with no gaps between them. She stopped abruptly, and the woman behind stumbled into her. Both lost their balance and almost fell. Their leg irons clanked, and the other woman thrust her forward roughly, cursing her in the accents of the Antwerp Docklands. "'Come on, princess, move your pretty pussy!' The girl did not seem to notice. One of the jailers stepped up behind her. "'Keep moving, you stupid cow!' With the length of knotted rope he hit her across the top of her thin bare arm, raising a vivid red welt. Jim fought to stop himself rushing to protect her, and the nearest guard sensed the movement. He swung the muzzle of his musket towards Jim, who stepped back. He knew that at that range the buckshot would have disemboweled him, but the girl had seen his gesture too, recognised something in him. She stumbled forward, her eyes filled with tears of pain from the lash, massaging the crimson welt with her other hand. She kept those haunting eyes on his face as she passed where Jim stood rooted to the deck. He knew it was dangerous and futile to speak to her, but the words were out before he could bite down on them, and there was pity in his tone. "'They've starved you!' A pale travesty of a smile flickered across her lips. 
but she gave no other sign of having heard him. Then the harridan in the line behind her shoved her forward. No young cock for you today, your highness. You will have to use your finger. Keep moving. The girl went on down the deck away from him. Let me give you some advice, Carol, said the purser at his shoulder. Don't try anything with any of those bitches. That's the shortest way to hell. Jim mustered a grin. I'm a brave man, but not a stupid one. He held out his hand, and the purser counted eight silver coins into his palm. He swung a leg over the rail. I'll bring out a load of vegetables for you tomorrow. Then perhaps we can go ashore together and have a grog in one of the taverns. As he dropped down into the skiff, he muttered, Or I could break your neck and both your fat legs. He took his place at the tiller. Cast off, hoist the sail, he called to Zama, and brought the skiff onto the wind. They skimmed down the side of the mew. The port lids on the gun ports were open to let light and air into the gun decks. Jim looked into the nearest as he came level. The crowded, fetid gun deck was a vision from hell, and the stench was like a pigsty or cesspit. Hundreds of human beings had been crowded into that low, narrow space for months without relief. Jim tore away his gaze and glanced up at the ship's rail high above his head. He was still looking for the girl, but he expected to be disappointed. Then his pulse leapt as those unbelievably blue eyes stared down at him. In the line of women prisoners, the girl was shuffling along the rail near the bows. "'Your name! What's your name?' he called urgently. At that moment, to know it was the most important thing in the world. A reply was faint on the wind, but he read it on her lips. Louisa! I'll come back, Louisa, be of good cheer, he shouted recklessly, and she stared at him expressionlessly. Then he did something even more reckless. He knew it was madness, but she was starved. He snatched up the red stump nose he had kept back from the sail. It weighed almost ten pounds, but he tossed it up lightly. Louisa reached out and caught it in both hands with a hungry, desperate expression on her face. The grotesque trull in the line behind her jumped forward and tried to wrest it out of her grasp. Immediately three or four other women joined the struggle, fighting over the fish like a pack of she-wolves. Then the jailers rushed in to break up the melee, flogging and lashing the shrieking women with the knotted ropes. Jim turned away, sick to the guts, his heart torn with pity, and with some other emotion he did not recognise, for he had never experienced it before. The three sailed on in grim silence, but every few minutes Jim turned to look back at the prison ship. "'There's nothing you can do for her,' Mansur said at last. "'Forget her, cuz. She's out of your reach.' Jim's face darkened with anger and frustration. "'Is she?' "'You think you know everything, Mansur Courtney. We shall see, we shall see.' On the beach ahead, one of the grooms was holding a string of harnessed mules ready to help them beach the skiff. "'Don't just sit there like a pair of cormorants drying your wings on a rock. Get the sail down!' Jim snarled at the other two, with the formless, undirected anger still dark upon him. They waited on the first line of the surf, hanging on the oars, waiting for the right wave. When Jim saw it coming, he shouted, "'Here we go! Give way together! Pull!' It swept under the stern, and then suddenly, exhilaratingly, they were surfing on the brow of the curling green wave, racing onto the beach. The wave carried them high, then pulled back to leave them stranded. They jumped out, and when the groom galloped in with the team of mules, they hitched onto the trek chain. They ran beside the team, whooping to drive them on, dragging the skiff well above the high water mark, then unhitched it. "'I'll need the team again first thing tomorrow morning,' Jim told the groom. "'Have them ready.' "'So we're going out to that hell ship again, are we?' Mansur asked flatly. "'To take them a load of vegetables,' Jim feigned innocence. "'What do you want to trade in return?' Mansur asked with equal insouciance. Jim punched his arm lightly, and they jumped onto the bare backs of the mules. Jim took one last brooding look across the bay to where the prison ship was anchored, then they rode round the shore of the lagoon up the hill towards the whitewashed buildings of the estate, the homestead and the go-down that Tom Courtney had named High Weald, after the great mansion in Devon where he and Dorian had been born, and which neither of them had laid eyes on for so many years. 
The name was the only thing that the two houses had in common. This one was built in the Cape style. The roof was thatched thickly with reeds. The graceful gabled ends and the archway leading into the central courtyard had been designed by the celebrated Dutch architect Arnreit. The name of the estate and the family emblem were incorporated into the ornate fresco of cherubs and saints above the archway. The emblem depicted a long-barrelled cannon on its wheeled carriage with a ribbon below it and the letters CBTC for Courtney Brothers Trading Company. In a separate panel was the legend High Wheeled, 1711. The house had been built in the same year that Jim and Mansur were born. As they clattered through the archway and into the cobbled courtyard, Tom Courtney came stamping out of the main doors of the warehouse. He was a big man, over six foot tall, heavy in the shoulders. His dense black beard was shot through with silver, and his pate was innocent of a single strand of hair, but thick curls surrounded the shiny, bald scalp and bushed down the back of his neck. His belly, once flat and hard, had taken on a magisterial girth. His craggy features were laced with webs of laughter lines, while his eyes gleamed with humour and the contentment of a supremely confident, prosperous man. "'James Courtney, you've been gone so long I'd forgotten what you looked like. It's good of you to drop in, I hate to trouble you, but do any of you intend doing any work this day?' Jim hunched his shoulders guiltily. "'We were almost run down by a Dutch ship, damned nigh sunk us.' Then we caught a red steen brass the size of a cart horse. It took two hours to bring it in. We had to take it out to sell it to one of the ships in the bay. But Jesus, boy, you've had a busy morning. Don't tell me the rest of your tribulations. Let me guess. You were attacked by a French ship of the line and charged by a wounded hippo. Tom roared with delight at his own wit. Ha! Anyway, how much did you get for a cart horse sized steen brass? he demanded. Eight silver guilders. Tom whistled. Oh, it must have been a monster. Then his expression became serious. Ain't no excuse, lad. I didn't give you the week off. You should have been back hours ago. I haggled with the purser of the Dutch ship, Jim told him. He will take all the provender we can send him, and at good prices, papa. A shrewd expression replaced the laughter in Tom's eyes. Seems you ain't wasted your time. Well done, lad. At that moment, a fine-looking woman, almost as tall as Tom, stepped out of the kitchens at the opposite end of the courtyard. Her hair was scraped up into a heavy bun on top of her head, and the sleeves of her blouse were rolled up around her plump, sun-browned arms. "'Tom Courtney, don't you realise the poor child left this morning without breakfast? Let him eat a meal before you bully him any more?' "'Sarah Courtney!' Tom shouted back. "'This poor child of yours isn't five years old any longer!' "'It's your lunchtime, too,' Sarah changed tack. "'Yasmini, the girls, and I have been slaving over the stove all morning. "'Come along now, all of you.' "'Tom threw up his hands in capitulation. "'Sarah, you're a tyrant, but I could eat a buffalo bull with the horns on,' he said. "'He came down off the veranda and put one arm around Jim's shoulders, "'the other around Mansur's, and led them towards the kitchen door, "'where Sarah waited for them with her arms powdered to the elbows with flour.' Zama took the team of mules and led them out of the courtyard towards the stables. Zama, tell my brother that the ladies are waiting for lunch for him, Tom called after him. I will tell them, Obas, Zama used the most respectful term of address for the master of High Weald. As soon as you've finished eating, you get back here with all the men, Jim warned him. We have to pick and load a cargo of vegetables to take out to the lucky seagull tomorrow. The kitchen was bustling with women, most of them freed house slaves, graceful, golden-skinned Javanese women from Batavia. Jim went to embrace his mother. Sarah pretended to be put out. Don't be a great booby, James! But she flushed with pleasure as he lifted her and bussed her on both cheeks. Put me down at once and let me get on. If you don't love me, then at least Auntie Yazzie does. He went to the delicate, lovely woman who was wrapped in the arms of her own son. "'Come now, Mansur, it's my turn now.' He lifted Yasmini out of Mansur's embrace. She wore a long chagra skirt and a koli blouse of vivid silk. She was as slim and light as a girl, her skin a glowing amber, her slanting eyes dark as onyx. 
The snowy blaze through the front of her dense, dark hair was not a sign of age. She had been born with it, as had her mother and grandmother before her. With the women fussing over them, the men seated themselves at the top of the long yellow wood table, which was piled with bowls and platters. They were dishes of babuti curry in the Malayan style, redolent with mutton and spices, rich with eggs and yoghurt, an enormous venison pie made with potatoes and the meat of the springbuck Jim and Mansur had shot out in the open felt, loaves of bread still hot from the oven, pottery crocks of yellow butter, jugs of thick sour milk and small beer. "'Where's Dorian?' Tom demanded from the head of the table. "'Late again?' "'Did someone call my name?' Dorian sauntered into the kitchen, still lean and athletic, handsome and debonair, his head a mass of copper curls to match his son's. He wore high riding boots that were dusty to the knees and a wide-brimmed straw hat. He spun the hat across the room and the women greeted him with a chorus of delight. "'Quiet, all of you! You sound like a flock of hens when a jackal gets into the coop!' Tom bellowed. The noise subsided almost imperceptibly. "'Come on, sit down, Dorry, before you drive these women wild. "'We are to hear the tale of the giant Steenbrass the boys caught, "'and the deal they have done with the VOC ship lying out in the bay.' "'Dorian took the chair beside his brother "'and sank the blade of his knife through the crust of the venison pie. "'There was a sigh of approval from all of the company "'as a fragrant cloud of steam rose to the high stinkwood beams of the ceiling.' As Sarah spooned the food onto the blue willow pattern plates, the room was filled with banter from the men, giggles and spontaneous demonstrations of affection from the women. "'What's wrong with Jim Boy?' Sarah looked across the table and raised her voice above the pandemonium. "'Nothing,' said Tom, with the next spoonful halfway to his mouth. He looked sharply at his only son. "'Is there?' Slowly, silence settled over the table, and everyone stared at Jim. "'Why aren't you eating?' Sarah demanded with alarm. Jim's vast appetite was a family legend. "'What you need is a dose of sulphur and molasses.' "'I'm fine, just not hungry.' Jim glanced down at the pie he had barely touched, then at the circle of faces. "'Don't look at me like that. I'm not going to die.' Sarah was still watching him. What happened today? Jim knew she could see through him, as though he was made of glass. He jumped to his feet. Please excuse me, he said, pushed back his stool and stalked out of the kitchen into the yard. Tom lumbered to his feet to follow him, but Sarah shook her head. Leave him be, husband, she said. Only one person could give Tom Courtney orders, and he subsided obediently onto his stool. In contrast to the mood of only moments before, the room was plunged into a heavy, fraught silence. Sarah looked across the table. What happened out there today, Mansa? Jim went aboard the convict ship in the bay. He saw things that upset him. What things? she asked. The ship is filled with women prisoners. They'd been chained, starved and beaten. The ship stinks like a pigsty. Mansur said, repugnance and pity in his voice. Silence descended again as they visualised the scene Mansur had described. Then Sarah said softly, And one of the women on board was young and pretty. How did you know that? Mansur stared at her with astonishment. Jim strode out through the archway and down the hill towards the paddock at the edge of the lagoon. As the track emerged from the trees, he put two fingers into his mouth and whistled. The stallion was a little separated from the rest of the herd, grazing on the green grass at the edge of the water. He threw up his head at the sound, and the blaze on his forehead shone like a diadem in the sunlight. He arched his neck, flared his wide Arabian nostrils, and stared across at Jim with luminous eyes. Jim whistled again. Come, Drumfire, he called. Come to me. Drumfire glided from a standstill into a full gallop in a few strides. 
For such a large animal, he moved with the grace of an antelope. Just watching him, Jim felt his black mood begin to evaporate. The animal's coat gleamed like oiled mahogany, and his mane streamed out over his back like a war banner. His steel-shod hoofs tore chunks out of the green turf with the thunder of rapid fire from a massed battery of cannon, the sound for which Jim had named him. Riding against the burghers of the colony and the officers of the cavalry regiment, Jim and Drumfire had won the governor's gold plate last Christmas Day. In doing so, Drumfire had proved he was the fastest horse in Africa, and Jim had spurned an offer of two thousand guilders for him from Colonel Stephanus Kaiser, the commander of the garrison. Horse and rider had won honour but no friends that day. Drumfire swept down the track running straight at Jim. He loved to try and make his master flinch. Jim stood his ground, and at the very last instant Drumfire swerved so close that the wind of his passing ruffled Jim's hair. Then he came to a dead stop on braced front legs, nodding and neighing wildly. "'You great showman,' Jim told him. "'Behave yourself!' Suddenly, docile as a kitten, Drumfire came back and nuzzled his chest, snuffling at the pockets of his coat until he smelt the slice of plum cake. "'Cupboard, love,' Jim told him firmly. Drumfire pushed him with his forehead, gently at first, but then so demandingly that Jim was lifted off his feet. "'You don't deserve it, but—' Jim relented and held out the cake. Drumfire drooled into his open palm as he picked up every last crumb with the velvet lips. Jim wiped his hand on the shining neck, then laid one hand on the horse's withers and leapt lightly onto his back. At the touch of his heels, Drumfire glided again into that miraculous stride, and the wind whipped tears from the corners of Jim's eyes. They raced along the edge of the lagoon, but when Jim touched him behind the shoulder with his toe, the stallion did not hesitate. He turned and plunged into the shallows, startling a shoal of mullet into brief flight like a handful of spinning silver gilders across the green surface. Abruptly, Drumfire was into the deep, and Jim slipped into the water beside him as he swam. He grasped a handful of the long mane and let the stallion tow him along. Swimming was another of Drumfire's great joys, and the horse gave loud grunts of pleasure. As soon as he felt the bottom of the far shore under the horse's hooves, Jim slid onto his back again, and they burst out onto the beach at full stride. Jim turned him down towards the seashore, and they crossed the high dunes, leaving deep hoof-prints in the white sand, and went down the other side to where the surf crashed onto the beach. Without check, Drumfire galloped along the edge of the water, running first on the hard, wet sand, then belly-deep through salt water as the waves came ashore. At last Jim slowed him to a walk. The stallion had galloped away his black mood, his anger and guilt left on the wind. He jumped up and stretched to his full height on Drumfire's back, and the horse adjusted his gait smoothly to help him balance. This was just one of the tricks they had taught each other. Standing high, Jim gazed out over the bay. The mew had swung on her anchor so that she lay broadside to the beach, from this distance she looked as honest and respectable as a burgher's good wife, giving no outward sign of the horrors hidden within her drab howl. "'Wind's changed,' Jim told his horse, who cocked an ear back to listen to his voice. "'It'll blow up a hell of a storm in the next few days.' He imagined the conditions below the decks of the convict ship, if she was still anchored in the bay, which was open to the west when it came. His black mood was returning— he dropped back astride Drumfire and rode on at a more sedate pace towards the castle. By the time they arrived below the massive stone walls, his clothing had dried, although his felskun boots, made of kudu skin, were still damp. Captain Hugo van Hochen, the quartermaster of the garrison, was in his office beside the main powder magazine. He gave Jim a friendly welcome, then offered him a pipe of Turkish tobacco and a cup of Arabian coffee. Jim refused the pipe, but drank the dark, bitter brew with relish. His aunt Yasmini had introduced them all to it. Jim and the quartermaster were old accomplices. It was accepted between them that Jim was the unofficial go-between of the Courtney family. 
If Hugo signed a license stating that the company was unable to supply provisions or stores to any ship in the bay, then the private chandler designated in the document was allowed to make good the shortfall. Hugo was also an avid fisherman, and Jim related the saga of the Stienbras to a chorus from Hugo of Ach, Niemann, and Dis Arnie, it's not true. When Jim shook hands with him and took his leave, he had in his pocket a blank license to trade in the name of Courtney Brothers Trading Company. "'I'll come and drink coffee with you again on Saturday,' Jim winked. Hugo nodded genially. "'You will be more than welcome, my young friend.' From long experience, he knew that he could trust Jim to bring his commission in a little purse of gold and silver coin. Back in the stables on High Wheel, Jim rubbed Drumfire down, rather than letting one of the grooms do the job, then left him with a manger of crushed corn, over which he had dribbled molasses. Drumfire had a sweet tooth. The fields and orchards behind the stables were filled with freed slaves, gathering in the fresh produce destined for the mew. Most of the bushel baskets were already filled with potatoes and apples, pumpkins and turnips. His father and Mansur were supervising the harvest. Jim left them to it and went down to the slaughterhouse. In the cavernous cool room, with its thick windowless walls, dozens of freshly slaughtered sheep carcasses hung from hooks in the ceiling. Jim drew the knife from the sheath on his belt and whipped the blade with practised strokes across the whetstone as he went to join his Uncle Dorian. To prepare all the produce they needed to supply to the ship, everyone on the estate had to help with the work. Freed slaves dragged in fat-tailed Persian sheep from the holding pen, held them down and pulled back their heads to expose the throats to the stroke of the knife. Other willing hands lifted the dead animals onto the hooks and stripped off the bloody fleeces. Weeks ago, Carl Otto, the estate butcher, had filled his smoke room with hams and sausages for just such an opportunity. In the kitchens, all the women from eldest to youngest were helping Sarah and Yasmini to bottle fruit and pickle vegetables. Despite their best efforts, it was late in the afternoon before the convoy of mule carts was fully loaded and had set off down to the beach. The transfer of the provisions from the carts to the beached bumboats took most of the rest of the night, and it was almost dawn before they were loaded. Despite Jim's misgivings, the wind had not increased in strength, and the sea and surf were manageable as the mule teams dragged the heavily laden boats down the sand. The first glimmer of dawn was in the eastern sky by the time the little convoy was on its way. Jim was at the tiller in the leading boat, and Mansur was on the stroke oar. "'What have you got in the bag, Jim?' he asked between strokes. "'Ask no questions, and you'll hear no lies.' Jim glanced down at the waterproof canvas bag that lay between his feet. He kept his voice low so that his father did not overhear. Luckily, Tom Courtney, who stood in the bows, had fired so many heavy muskets in his long career as a hunter that his hearing was dull. "'Is it a gift for a sweetheart?' Mansur grinned slyly in the darkness. But Jim ignored him. That arrow was too near the bull's-eye for comfort. Jim had carefully packed into the bag a bundle of salted, sun-dried venison, the ubiquitous biltong of the Cape Boers, ten pounds of hard ship's biscuit wrapped in a cloth, a folding knife, and a triangular bladed file that he had pilfered from the estate workshop, a tortoise-shell comb which belonged to his mother, and a letter written on a single sheet of paper in Dutch. They came up to the mew and Tom Courtney hailed her in a bull bellow. Longboat with supplies! Permission to hook on! There was an answering shout from the ship, and they rowed in, bumping lightly against the tall hull. With her long legs folded under her, Louisa Leuven sat on the hard deck in the noisome semi-darkness that was lit only by the feeble light of the fighting lanterns. Her shoulders were covered with a single thin cotton blanket of the poorest quality. The gun ports were closed and bolted. The guards were taking no chances. With the shore so close, some of the women might take the risk in the cold green currents, undeterred by the possibility of drowning or being devoured by the monstrous sharks 
that were attracted to these waters by the swarming seal colony on Robben Island. While the women had been on deck that afternoon, the cook had thrown overboard a bucket of guts from the Red Steenbrass. The head jailer had pointed out to his prisoners the triangular fins of the sharks as they sped in to snatch these bloody morsels. "'Don't any of you filthy slattens get any ideas of escape,' he cautioned them. At the beginning of the voyage, Louisa had claimed for herself this berth under one of the huge bronze cannon. She was stronger than most of the other wizened, undernourished convicts, and, of necessity, she had learned how to protect herself. Life on board was like being in a pack of wild animals. The women around her were every bit as dangerous and merciless as wolves, but shrewder and more cunning. At the beginning, Louisa knew she had to procure a weapon, so she had managed to prise loose a strip of the bronze beading from under the carriage of the cannon. She had spent long hours of the night stropping this against the cannon barrel until it had a sharp double stiletto edge. She tore a strip of canvas from the hem of her shift and wrapped it round the hilt to make a handle. She carried the dagger day and night in the pouch she wore strapped around her waist under the canvas shift. So far she had been forced to cut only one of the other women. Nedda was a Frieslander, with heavy thighs and bottom, fat arms and a pudding face covered with freckles. She had once been a notorious whore mistress for the nobility. She had specialised in procuring young children for her rich clients until she became too greedy and tried to blackmail one. On a hot tropical night, as the ship lay becalmed a few degrees south of the equator, Big Nedder had crept up on Louisa in the night and pinned her down under her suffocating weight. None of the jailers or any of the women had come to Louisa's rescue as she screamed and struggled. Instead, they had giggled and egged Nedder on. "'Give it to the high and mighty bitch. Listen to her squealing for it. She loves it. Go on, Big Nedder. Shove your fist up that prim royal pussy.' When Louisa felt the woman prise her legs apart with a fat knee, she reached down, slipped the blade out of its pouch, and slashed Nedda's chubby red cheek. Nedda howled and rolled off her, clutching the deep, spurting wound. Then she crept away, sobbing and moaning, into the darkness. During the next few weeks the wound had festered, and Nedda had crouched like a bear in the darkest recess of the gun deck, her face swollen to double its size, pus leaking out through the dirty bandage, dripping yellow and thick as cream from her chin. Since then, Nedda had kept well clear of Louisa, and the other women had learned from her example. They left her well alone. For Louisa, this dreadful voyage seemed to have lasted all her life. Even during this respite from the open sea, while the Mew lay at anchor in Table Bay, the magnitude of the ordeal she had undergone still haunted her. She cowered further into her refuge under the cannon, and shuddered as each of the separate memories pricked her like thorns. The throng of humanity was pressed close about her. They were packed so tightly into every inch of the deck that it was almost impossible to escape the touch of other filthy bodies crawling with lice. In rough weather, the latrine bucket slopped over and the sewage ran down the crowded deck. It soaked the women's clothing and their thin cotton blankets where they lay. During the occasional spells of calm weather, the crew pumped seawater down the hatches, and the women went down on their knees to scrub the planks with the coarse holy stones. It was in vain, for during the next storm the filth splashed over them again. In the dawn, when the hatches were taken off the companionways, they took turns to carry the reeking wooden buckets up the ladders to the deck and empty them over the side while the crew and the guards jeered at them. Every Sunday, in any kind of weather, the prisoners were mustered on deck while the guards stood over them with loaded muskets. The women in their leg irons and ragged canvas shifts shivered and hugged themselves with their thin arms, their skin blue and pimpled with the cold, while the Dutch reformed Dormany harangued them for their sins. When this ordeal was over, the crew set up canvas screens on the foredeck, and in groups the prisoners were forced behind them while streams of seawater were sprayed over them from the ship's pumps. Louisa and some of the more fastidious women stripped off their shifts and tried as best they could to wash off the filth. 
The screens fluttered in the wind and afforded them almost no privacy, and the seamen on the pumps or in the rigging overhead whistled and called ribald comments. Look at the dugs on that cow. You could sail a ship of the line up that great hairy harbour. Louisa learned to use her wet shift to cover herself, as she crouched low, screening herself behind the other women. The few hours of cleanliness were worth the humiliation, but as soon as her shift dried and the warmth of her body hatched the next batch of knits, she began to scratch again. With her bronze blade she whittled a splinter of wood into a fine tooth comb and spent hours each day under the gun carriage combing the knits out of her long golden hair and from the tufts of her body hair. Her pathetic attempts at bodily hygiene seemed to highlight the slovenliness of the other women, which infuriated them. Look at her royal bloody highness at it again, combing her bushy hairs. She's better than the rest of us, going to marry the governor of Batavia when we get there, didn't you know? You going to invite us to the wedding, princess? Nedda here will be your bridesmaid, won't you, Nedda Leafling? The livid scar down Nedda's fat cheek twisted into a grotesque grin, but her eyes were filled with hatred in the dim lantern light. Louisa had learned to ignore them. She heated the point of her blade in the smoky flame of the lantern in the gimbal above her head, ran the blade down the seams of the shift in her lap, and the knits popped and frizzled. She held the blade back in the flame, and while she waited for it to heat again, she ducked her head to peer through the narrow slit in the joint of the port lid. She had used the point of her blade to enlarge this aperture until she had an unobstructed view. There was a padlock on the port lid, but she had worked for weeks to loosen the shackles. Then she had used soot from the lantern to darken the raw wood, rubbing it in with her finger to conceal it from the weekly inspection of the ship's officers, carried out on Sunday while the convicts were on the open deck for the prayer meeting and ablutions. Louisa always returned to her berth terrified that her work had been discovered. When she found that it had not, her relief was so intense that often she broke down and wept. Despair was always so near at hand, lurking like a wild beast, ready to pounce at any moment and devour her. More than once over the past months she had sharpened her little blade until the edge could shave the fine blonde hairs of her forearm. Then she had hidden away under the gun carriage and felt for the pulse in her wrist where the blue artery beat so close to the surface. Once she had laid the sharp edge against the skin and steeled herself to make the deep incision, then she had looked up at the thin chink of light coming through the joint of the port lid. It seemed to be a promise. No, she whispered to herself. I am going to escape. I am going to endure. To bolster her determination, she spent hours during those terrible endless days, when the ship crashed through the high turbulent storms of the southern Atlantic, daydreaming of the bright happy days of her childhood, which now seemed to have been in another hazy existence. She trained herself to retreat into her imagination, and to shut out the reality in which she was trapped. She dwelt on the memory of her father, Hendrik Lofen, a tall, thin man with his black suit buttoned high. She saw again his crisp white lace stock, the stockings that covered his scrawny shanks, lovingly darned by her mother, and the pinchbeck buckles on his square-toed shoes, polished until they shone like pure silver. Under the wide brim of his tall black hat, the lugubriousness of his features was given the lie by mischievous blue eyes. She had inherited hers from him. She remembered all of his funny, fascinating, and poignant stories. Every night when she was young, he had carried her up the stairs to her cot. He had tucked her in, and sat beside her, reciting them to her, while she tried desperately to fight off sleep. When she was older, she had walked with him in the garden, her hand in his, through the tulip fields of the estate, going over the day's lessons with him. She smiled secretly now as she recalled his endless patience with her questions, and his sad, proud smile when she arrived at the right answer to a mathematical problem, with only a little prompting. Hendrik Lofen had been tutor to the van Rutus family, one of the preeminent merchant families of Amsterdam. Meneer Kuhn van Rutus was one of Het Seventien, the board of directors of the VOC. 
His warehouses ran for a quarter of a mile along both banks of the inner canal, and he traded around the world with his fleet of fifty-three fine ships. His country mansion was one of the most magnificent in Holland. During the winter, his numerous household lived in Heusch Brabant, the huge mansion overlooking the canal. Louisa's family had three rooms at the top of the house to themselves, and from the window of her tiny bedroom she could look down on the heavily laden barges and the fishing boats coming in from the sea. However, the spring was the time she loved the most. That was when the family moved out into the country, to Moy Oitzich, their country estate. In those magical days, Hendrik and his family lived in a cottage across the lake from the big house. Louisa remembered the long skeins of geese coming up from the south as the weather warmed. They landed with a great splash on the lake, and their honking woke her in the dawn. She cuddled under her eiderdown and listened to her father's snores from the next room. She had never again felt so warm and safe as she did then. Louisa's mother, Anne, was English. Her father had brought her to Holland when she was a child. He had been a corporal in the bodyguard of William of Orange after he had become King of England. When Anne was sixteen, she had been engaged as a junior cook in the Van Ritter's household and had married Hendrik within a year of taking up her post. Louisa's mother had been plump and jolly, always surrounded by an aura of the delicious aromas of the kitchen, spices and vanilla, saffron and baking bread. She had insisted that Louisa learn English, and they always spoke it when they were alone. Louisa had an ear for language. In addition, Anne taught her cooking and baking, embroidery, sewing, and all the feminine skills. Louisa had been allowed as a special concession by Meneer van Ritters to take her lessons with his own children, although she was expected to sit at the back of the classroom and keep quiet. Only when she was alone with her father could she ask the questions that had burned all day on the tip of her tongue. Very early she had learned deferential manners. Only twice in all the years had Louisa laid eyes on Mefro van Ritters. On both occasions she had spied on her from the classroom window as she stepped into the huge black-curtained carriage, assisted by half a dozen servants. She was a mysterious figure, clad in layers of black brocaded silks and a dark veil that hid her face. Louisa had overheard her mother discussing the Chatelaine with the other servants. She suffered from some skin disease which made her features as monstrous as a vision of hell. Even her own husband and children were never allowed to see her unveiled. On the other hand, Meneer van Ritters sometimes visited the classroom to check on his offspring's progress. He often smiled at the pretty demure little girl who sat at the back of the room. Once he even paused beside Louisa's desk to watch her writing on her slate in a neat and well-formed script. He smiled and touched her head. "'What lovely hair you have, little one,' he murmured. His own daughters tended towards plump and plain. Louisa blushed. She thought how kind he was, and yet as remote and powerful as God. He even looked rather like the image of God in the huge oil painting in the banquet hall. It had been painted by the famous artist Rembrandt Harminson van Rijn, a protégé of the van Ritters family. It was said that Meneer's grandfather had posed for the artist. The painting depicted the Day of Resurrection, with the merciful Lord lifting the saved souls into paradise, while in the background the condemned were herded into the burning pit by demons. The painting had fascinated Louisa, and she spent hours in front of it. Now in the reeking gun-deck of the Mew, combing the nits from her hair, Louisa felt like one of the unfortunates destined for Hades. She felt tears near the surface, and tried to put the sad thoughts from her mind, but they kept crowding back. She had been just ten when the Black Plague had struck Amsterdam again, beginning as before in the rat-infested docks, then sweeping through the city. Meneer van Ritters had fled with all his household from Heus Brabant, and they had taken refuge at Moy Oetzig. He ordered that all the gates to the estate were to be locked and armed sentries placed at each to deny access to strangers. However, when the servants unpacked one of the leather trunks they had brought from Amsterdam, a huge rat leapt out and scuttled down the staircase. Even so, for weeks they believed themselves safe, until one of the housemaids collapsed in a dead faint while she was waiting on the family at dinner.
Two footmen carried the girl into the kitchen and laid her on the long table. When Louisa's mother opened the top of her blouse, she gasped as she recognised the necklace of red blotches around the girl's throat, the stigmata of the plague, the ring of roses. She was so distressed that she took little notice of the black flea that sprang from the girl's clothing onto her own skirts. Before sunset the following day, the girl was dead. The next morning two of the van Ritter's children were missing when Louisa's father called the classroom to order. One of the nursery maids came into the room and whispered in his ear. He nodded, then said, "'Corbus and Tinus will not be joining us today. Now, little ones, please open your spelling books at page five. No, Petronella, that is page ten. Petronella was the same age as Louisa, and she was the only one of the Van Ritter's children who had been friendly to her. They shared a double desk at the back of the room. She often brought small gifts for Louisa, and sometimes invited her to play with her dolls in the nursery. On Louisa's last birthday, she had given her one of her favourites. Of course, her nurse had made Louisa give it back. When they walked along the edge of the lake, Petronella held Louisa's hand. "'Tinus was so sick last night,' she whispered. "'He vomited. It smelt awful.' Halfway through the morning, Petronella stood up suddenly, and without asking permission, started towards the door. "'Where are you going, Petronella?' Hendrik Loven demanded sharply. She turned and stared at him with a bloodless face. Then, without a word, she collapsed onto the floor. That evening Louisa's father told her, "'Manier van Ritters has ordered me to close the classroom. None of us is allowed up to the big house again until the sickness has passed. We are to stay here in the cottage.' "'What will we eat, Papa?' Louisa, like her mother, was always practical. "'Your mother is bringing down food for us from the pantries, cheese, ham, sausages, apples, and potatoes. I have my little vegetable garden and the rabbit hutch and the chickens. You will help me work in the garden. We will continue your lessons. You will make swifter progress without the duller children to hold you back. It will be like a holiday. We will enjoy ourselves. But you are not allowed to leave the garden, do you understand?' he asked her seriously, as he scratched the red flea-bite on his bony wrist. For three days they had enjoyed themselves. Then the next morning, as Louisa was helping her mother prepare breakfast, Anne fainted over the kitchen stove and spilled boiling water down her leg. Louisa helped her father carry her up the stairs and lay her on the big bed. They wrapped her scalded leg in bandages soaked in honey. Then Hendrik unbuttoned the front of her dress and stared in terror at the ring of roses around her throat. The fever descended upon her with the speed of a summer storm. Within an hour her skin was blotched with red and seemed almost too hot to touch. Louisa and Hendrik sponged her down with cold water from the lake. "'Be strong, my liefling, Hendrik whispered to her, as she tossed and groaned and soaked the mattress with her sweat. "'God will protect you.' They took turns to sit with her during the night, but in the dawn Louisa screamed for her father. When he came scrambling up the stairs, Louisa pointed at her mother's naked lower body. On both sides of her groin, at the juncture of her thighs with her belly, monstrous carbuncles had swelled to the size of Louisa's clenched fist. They were hard as stones and a furious purple like ripe plums. "'The buboes!' Hendrik touched one. Anne screamed wildly in agony at his light touch, and her bowels let loose an explosion of gas and yellow diarrhoea that soaked the sheets. Hendrik and Louisa lifted her out of the stinking bed, and laid her on a clean mattress on the floor. By evening her pain was so intense and unrelenting that Hendrik could bear his wife's shrieks no longer. His blue eyes were bloodshot and haunted. "'Fetch my shaving razor,' he ordered Louisa. She scurried across to the wash basin in the corner of the bedroom and brought it to him. It had a beautiful mother-of-pearl handle. Louisa had always enjoyed watching her father in the early mornings lathering his cheeks, then stripping off the white soap suds with the straight gleaming blade. "'What are you going to do, Papa?' she asked, as she watched him sharpening the edge on the leather strop. "'We must let out the poison. It is killing your mother. Hold her still.' Gently Louisa took hold of her mother's wrists. "'It's going to be all right, Mamma. 
Papa is going to make it better. Hendrik took off his black coat and in his white shirt came back to the bed. He straddled his wife's legs to hold her down. Sweat was pouring down his cheeks, and his hand shook wildly as he laid the razor edge across the huge purple swelling in her groin. Forgive me, O oh merciful God, he whispered, then pressed down and drew the blade across the carbuncle, cutting deeply and cleanly. For a moment nothing happened. Then a tide of black blood and custard yellow pus erupted out of the deep wound. It splattered across the front of Hendrick's white shirt and up to the low ceiling of the bedroom above his head. Anne's back arched like a longbow, and Louisa was hurled against the wall. Hendrick cringed into a corner, stunned by the violence of his wife's contortions. Anne writhed and rolled and screamed, her face in a rictus so horrible that Louisa was terrified. She clasped both hands over her own mouth to prevent herself screaming as she watched the blood spurt in powerful regular jets from the wound. Gradually the pulsing scarlet fountain shriveled, and Anne's agony eased. Her screams died away, until at last she lay still and deadly pale in a spreading pool of blood. Louisa crept back to her side and touched her arm. Mama, it's all right now. Papa has let all the poison out. You are going to be well again soon. Then she looked across at her father. She had never seen him like this. He was weeping, and his lips were slack and blubbery. Saliva dripped from his chin. Don't cry, Papa, she whispered. She will wake up soon. But Anne never woke again. Her father took a spade from the tool shed and went down to the bottom of the orchard. He began to dig in the soft soil under a big apple tree. It was mid-afternoon before the grave was deep enough. He came back to the house, his eyes a vacant blue like the sky above. He was racked with shivering fits. Louisa helped him wrap Anne in the blood-soaked sheet and walked beside him as he carried his wife to the bottom of the orchard. He laid the bundle beside the open grave and climbed down into it. Then he reached up and lifted Anne down. He laid her on the damp, fungus-smelling earth, then climbed out and reached for the spade. Louisa sobbed as she watched him fill in the grave and tamp down the earth. Then she went out into the field beyond the hedge and picked an armful of flowers. When she came back, her father was no longer in the orchard. Louisa arranged the tulips over where her mother's head must be. It seemed that the well of her tears had dried up. Her sobs were painful and dry. When she went back to the cottage, she found her father sitting at the table, his shirt filthy with his wife's blood and the grave soil. His head was cupped in his hands, his shoulders racked by shivering. When he lifted his head and looked at her, his face was pale and blotched and his teeth chattered. Papa, are you sick too? She started towards him, then shrank back as he opened his mouth and a solid stream of bile brown vomit burst through his lips and splashed across the scrub wooden tabletop. Then he slumped out of his chair onto the stone flagged floor. He was too heavy for her to lift, or even to drag up the stairs, so she tended him where he lay, cleaning away the vomit and liquid excrement, sponging him with icy lake water to bring down the fever. But she could not bring herself to take the razor to him. Two days later, he died on the kitchen floor. I have to be brave now. I am not a baby. I am ten years old, she told herself. There is nobody to help me. I have to take care of Papa myself. She went down into the orchard. The spade was lying beside her mother's grave, where her father had dropped it. She began to dig. It was hard, slow work. When the grave was deep, and her thin, childish arms did not have the strength to throw up the wet earth, she fetched an apple basket from the kitchen, filled it with earth, and pulled up each basket load from the bottom of the grave with a rope. When darkness fell, she worked on in the grave by lantern light. When it was as deep as she was tall, she went back to where her father lay and tried to drag him to the door. 
She was exhausted. Her hands were raw and blistered from the handle of the spade, and she could not move him. She spread a blanket over him to cover his pale, blotched skin and staring eyes, then lay down beside him and slept until morning. When she woke, sunlight was streaming through the window into her eyes. She got up and cut a slice from the ham hanging in the pantry and a wedge of cheese. She ate them with a hunk of dry bread. Then she went up to the stables at the rear of the big house. She remembered that she had been forbidden to go there, so she crept down behind the hedge. The stables were deserted, and she realised that the grooms must have fled with the other servants. She ducked through the secret hole in the hedge that she and Petronella had discovered. The horses were still in their stalls, unfed and unwatered. She opened the doors and shooed them out into the paddock. Immediately they galloped straight down to the lake shore and lined up along the edge to drink. She fetched a halter from the tack-room and went to Petronella's pony while it was still drinking. Petronella had allowed her to ride the pony whenever she wanted to, so the animal recognised and trusted her. As soon as it lifted its head, water dripping from its muzzle, Louisa slipped the halter over its ears and led it back to the cottage. The back door was wide enough for the pony to pass through. For a long while Louisa hesitated while she tried to think of some more respectful manner in which to take her father to his grave, but in the end she found a rope, hitched it to his heels, and the pony dragged him into the orchard with his head bouncing over the uneven ground. As he slipped over the lip of the shallow grave, Louisa wept for him for the last time. She took the halter off the pony and turned the animal loose in the paddock. Then she climbed down beside her father and tried to arrange his limbs neatly, but they were rigid. She left him as he lay, went out into the field, gathered another armful of flowers and strewed them over his body. She knelt beside the open grave and in a high, sweet voice sang the first verse of The Lord is My Shepherd in English, as her mother had taught her. Then she began to shovel the earth on top of him. By the time she had filled in the last spadeful, night had fallen and she crept back to the cottage, emotionally and physically numbed with exhaustion. She had neither the strength nor the desire to eat, nor even to climb the stairs to her bed. She lay down next to the hearth and almost immediately fell into a death-like sleep. She woke before morning, consumed by thirst and with a headache that felt as though her skull was about to burst open. When she tried to rise, she staggered and fell against the wall. She was nauseous and giddy, her bladder swollen and painful. She tried to make her way out into the garden to relieve herself, but a wave of nausea swept over her. She doubled over slowly and vomited in the middle of the kitchen floor, then, with horror, stared down at the steaming puddle between her feet. She staggered to the row of her mother's copper pots, which hung on hooks along the far wall, and looked at her reflection in the polished bottom of one. Slowly and reluctantly, she touched her throat and stared at the rosy necklace that adorned her milky skin. Her legs gave way, and she subsided onto the stone flags. Dark clouds of despair gathered in her mind, and her vision faded. Then, suddenly, she discovered a spark still burning in the darkness, a tiny spark of strength and determination. She clung to it, shielding it like a lamp flame fluttering in a high wind. It helped her to drive back the darkness. I have to think, she whispered to herself. I have to stand up. I know what will happen just the way it did to Mamma and Papa. I have to get ready. Using the wall, she pulled herself to her feet and stood swaying. I must hurry. I can feel it coming quickly. She remembered the terrible thirst that had consumed her dying parents. Water, she whispered. She staggered with the empty water bucket to the pump in the yard. Each stroke of the long handle was a trial of her strength and courage. Not everyone dies, she whispered to herself as she worked. I heard the grown-ups talking. They say that some of the young strong ones live. They don't die. Water flowed into the bucket. I won't die. I won't. I won't. When the bucket was full, she staggered to the rabbit hutch, then to the chicken run, and released all the animals and fowls to fend for themselves. I'm not going to be able to take care of you, she explained to them. 
Carrying the water bucket, she staggered unsteadily back to the kitchen, water slopping down her legs. She placed the bucket beside the hearth with a copper dipper hooked over the side. Food, she murmured, through the giddy mirages in her head. She fetched the remains of the cheese and ham and a basket of apples from the pantry and placed them where she could reach them. Cold. It will be cold at night. She dragged herself to the linen chest where her mother had kept what remained of her dowry, and took out a bundle of woolen blankets and a sheepskin rug and laid them out beside the hearth. Then she fetched an armful of firewood from the stack in the corner, and as the shivering fits began, she built up the fire. The door. Lock the door. She had heard that in the city starving pigs and dogs had broken into the houses where people lay too sick to defend themselves. The animals had eaten them alive. She closed the door and placed the locking bar in the brackets. She found her father's axe and a carving knife and laid them beside her mattress. There were rats in the thatch and the walls of the cottage. She had heard them scurrying about in the night, and her mother had complained of their nocturnal depredations in her pantry. Petronella had described to Louisa how a huge rat had got into the nursery of the big house while the new nursemaid was drunk on gin. Her father had found the horrid beast in her little sister's cot and had ordered the grooms to thrash the drunken nurse. The wretched woman's screams had penetrated the classroom and the children had exchanged glances of delicious horror as they listened. Now Louisa's skin crawled at the thought of lying helpless under a rat's razor fangs. With the last of her strength she brought down the largest of her mother's copper pots from its hook on the wall and placed it in the corner with the lid in place. She was a fastidious child, and the thought of fouling herself as her parents had done was abhorrent to her. "'That's all I can do,' she whispered, and collapsed onto the sheepskin. Dark clouds swirled in her head, and her blood seemed to boil in her veins with the heat of fever. "'Our Father which art in heaven,' she recited the prayer in English, as her mother had taught her. But the sweltering darkness overwhelmed her. Perhaps an eternity passed before she rose slowly to the surface of her mind, like a swimmer coming up from great depth. The darkness gave way to a blinding white light. Like sunlight on a snowfield, it dazzled and blinded her. The cold came out of the light, chilling her blood and frosting her bones, so she shivered wildly. Moving painfully, she drew the sheepskin over herself and rolled herself into a ball, hugging her knees to her chest. Then, fearfully, she reached behind. The flesh had wasted from her buttocks, leaving the bones poking through. She explored herself with a finger, dreading the feel of wet, slimy feces. But her skin was dry. She sniffed her finger tentatively. It was clean. She remembered overhearing her father talking to her mother. Diarrhea is the worst sign. Those who survive do not scour their bowels. It's a sign from Jesus. Louisa whispered to herself through chattering teeth. I did not dirty myself. I am not going to die. Then the scalding heat came back to burn away the cold and the white light. She tossed on the mattress in delirium, crying to her father and her mother and to Jesus. Thirst woke her. It was a fire in her throat, and her tongue filled her parched mouth like a sun-heated stone. She fought to raise herself on one elbow and reach for the water dipper. On the first attempt, she spilled most of it over her chest, then choked and gasped on what remained in the copper dipper. The few mouthfuls that she was able to swallow renewed her strength miraculously. On her next attempt, she forced down the entire contents of the dipper. She rested again, then drank another dipper full. She was satiated at last, and the fires in her blood for the moment seemed quenched. She curled under the sheepskin, her belly bulging with the water she had drunk. This time the sleep that overcame her was deep but natural. Pain roused her. She did not know where she was or what had caused it. Then she heard a harsh ripping sound close at hand. She opened her eyes and looked down. One of her feet protruded from under the sheepskin. Hunched over her bare foot was something as big as a tomcat, grey and hairy. For a moment she did not know what it was, but then the tearing sound came again, and the pain... She wanted to kick out at it or scream, but she was frozen with terror. This was her worst nightmare come true. The creature lifted its head and peered at her with bright bead-like eyes. 
It wiggled the whiskers on its long, pointed nose, and the sharp, curved fangs that overlapped its lower lip were rosy pink with her blood. It had been gnawing at her ankle. The little girl and the rat stared at each other, but Louisa was still paralysed with horror. The rat lowered its head and bit into her flesh again. Slowly, Louisa reached out for the carving knife beside her head. With the speed of a cat, she slashed out at the foul creature. The rat was almost as quick. It leapt high in the air, but the point of the knife split open its belly. It squealed and flopped over. Louisa dropped the knife and watched, wide-eyed, as the rat dragged itself across the stone floor, the slimy purple tangle of its entrails slithering after it. She was panting, and it took a long time for her heart to slow and her breathing to settle. Then she found that the shock had made her feel stronger. She sat up and examined her injured foot. The bites were deep. She tore a strip off her petticoat and wrapped it round her ankle. Then she realised she was hungry. She crawled to the table and pulled herself up. The rat had been at the ham. But she hacked away the chewed area and cut a thick slice, placed it on a slab of bread. Green mould was already growing on the cheese evidence of how long she had lain unconscious on the hearth. Mould and all, it was delicious. She drank the last dipper full of water. She wished she could replenish the bucket, but she knew she was not strong enough, and she was afraid to open the door. She dragged herself to the big copper pot in the corner and squatted over it. While she piddled, she lifted her skirt high and examined her lower belly. It was smooth and unblemished, her innocent little cleft naked of hair but she stared at the swollen buboes in her groin. They were hard as acorns and painful when she touched them, but not the same terrifying colour or size of those that had killed her mother. She thought about the razor, but knew she did not have the courage to do that to herself. I am not going to die. For the first time she truly believed it. She smoothed down her skirt and crawled back to her mattress. With the carving knife clutched in her hand, she slept again. After that, the days and nights mingled into a dreamlike succession of sleep and brief intervals of wakefulness. Gradually, these periods became longer. Each time she woke, she felt stronger, more able to care for herself. When she used the pot in the corner, she discovered that the buboes had subsided and had changed from red to pink. They were not nearly so painful when she touched them, but she knew she had to drink. She summoned every last shred of her courage and strength, tottered out into the yard and refilled the water bucket. Then she locked herself into the kitchen again. When the ham was just a bare bone and the apple basket was empty, she found that she was strong enough to make her way into the garden, where she pulled up a basket full of turnips and potatoes. She rekindled the fire with her father's flint and cooked a stew of vegetables flavoured with the ham bone. The food was delicious, and the strength flowed back into her. Each morning after that she set herself a task for the day. On the first she emptied the copper vessel she had been using as a chamber pot into her father's compost pit, then washed it out with lye and hot water, and hung it back on its hook. She knew her mother would have wanted that. The effort exhausted her and she crept back to the sheepskin. The next morning she felt strong enough to fill the bucket from the pump, strip off her filthy clothing and wash herself from head to toe with a ladle full of the precious soap her mother made by boiling sheep's fat and wood ash together. She was delighted to find that the buboes in her groin had almost disappeared. With her fingertips she could press them quite hard, and the pain was bearable. When her skin was pink and glowing, she scrubbed her teeth with a finger dipped in salt and dressed the rat bite on her leg from her mother's medicine chest. Then she chose fresh clothes from the linen chest. The next day she was hungry again. She caught one of the rabbits that were hopping trustingly around the garden, held it up by the ears, steeled herself and broke its neck with the stick her father had kept for that purpose. She gutted and skinned the carcass as her mother had taught her, then quartered it and placed it in the pot with onions and potatoes. When she had eaten it, she sucked the bones white. The following morning she went down to the bottom of the orchard and spent the morning tidying and tending her parents' graves. Until now she had not left the security of the cottage garden, but she gathered her courage, climbed through the hole in the hedge and crept up to the greenhouse. She made certain that no one was anywhere to be seen. The estate seemed deserted still. 
she picked out some of the choicest blooms from the vast array on the shelves, placed them in a handcart, trundled them back to the cottage and planted them in the newly smoothed earth of the graves. She chatted away to her parents as she worked, telling them every detail of her ordeal, about the rat and the rabbit and how she had cooked the stew in the black three-legged pot. "'I am so sorry I used your best copper pot, Mamma. she hung her head in shame, "'but I have washed it and hung it back on the wall.' When the graves had been decorated to her satisfaction, curiosity rose in her again. Once more she slipped through the hedge and took a circuitous route through the plantation of fir trees until she could approach the big house from the south side. It was silent and bleak. All the windows were shuttered. When she sidled up cautiously to the front door, she found that it was locked and barred. She stared at the cross that someone had sketched crudely on the door in red. The paint had run like tears of blood down the panel. It was the plague warning. Suddenly she felt lonely and bereft. She sat down on the steps that led up to the doorway. I think I am the only person left alive in the world. All the others are dead. At last she stood up, and made bold by desperation, ran round to the back door which led to the kitchen and the servants' quarters. She tried it. To her astonishment, it swung open. Hello, she called. Is anyone there? Stals? Hans? Where are you? The kitchen was deserted. She went through to the scullery and stuck her head through the door. Hello? There was no answer. She went through the entire house, searching every room, but they were all deserted. Everywhere there was evidence of the family's hasty departure. She left everything untouched and closed the kitchen door carefully when she left. On the way back to the cottage a thought occurred to her. She turned off the path and went down to the chapel at the end of the rose garden. Some of the headstones in the cemetery were two hundred years old and covered with green moss, but near the door there was a line of new graves. The headstones had not yet been set in place. The posies of flowers on them had faded and withered. Names and final messages were printed on black-edged cards on each pile of fresh earth. The ink had run in the rain, but Louisa could still read the names. She found one that read, Petronella Katrina Susanna van Ritters. Her friend lay between two of her younger brothers. Louisa ran back to the cottage, and that night she sobbed herself to sleep. When she woke, she felt sick and weak again, and her sorrow and loneliness had returned in full measure. She dragged herself out into the yard and washed her face and hands under the pump. Then abruptly she lifted her face, water running into her eyes and dripping off her chin. She cocked her head and slowly an expression of delight lit her face. Her eyes sparkled with blue lights. People, she said aloud, voices. They were faint and came from the direction of the big house. They have come back. I am not alone any more. Her face still wet. She raced to the hole in the hedge, jumped through and set off towards the big house. The sound of voices grew louder as she approached. At the potting shed she paused to catch her breath. She was about to run out onto the lawns when some instinct warned her to be cautious. She hesitated, then put her head slowly round the corner of the red brick wall. A chill of horror ran up her spine. She had expected to see coaches with the Van Ritter's coats of arms drawn up on the gravel driveway, and the family disembarking, with the coachmen, grooms and footmen hovering around them. Instead, a horde of strangers was running in and out of the front doors, carrying armfuls of silver, clothing and paintings. The doors had been smashed open, and the shattered panels hung drunkenly on their hinges. The looters were piling the treasures onto a row of handcarts, shouting and laughing with excitement. Louisa could see that they were the dregs of the city, of its docks and slums, army deserters, from prisons and barracks, that had thrown open their gates when all the trappings of civilised government had been swept away by the plague. They were dressed in the rags of the back streets and gutters, in odd pieces of military uniform and the ill-fitting finery of the rich they had plundered. One rascal, wearing a high-plumed hat, brandished a square-faced bottle of gin as he staggered down the main staircase, with a solid gold salver under his other arm. His face, flushed and marked with drink and dissipation, turned towards Louisa. 
Stunned by the scene, she was too slow to duck back behind the wall, and he spotted her. "'A woman! By Satan and all the devils of hell, a veritable woman, young and juicy as a ripe red apple!' He dropped the bottle and drew his sword. "'Come here, you sweet little filly! Let's take a look at what you're hiding under those pretty skirts!' He bounded down the steps. A wild cry went up from all his companions. "'A woman! After her, lads! The one who catches her gets the cherry!' They came in a screaming pack across the lawn towards her. Louisa swirled about and ran. At first she headed instinctively for the safety of the cottage. Then she realised that they were close behind her and would trap her there like a rabbit in its warren pursued by a troop of ferrets. She veered away across the paddock towards the woods. The ground was soft and muddy, and her legs had not yet recovered their full strength after her sickness. They were gaining on her, their shouts loud and jubilant. She reached the tree-line only just ahead of the leaders, but she knew these woods intimately, for they were her playground. She twisted and turned along paths that were barely discernible and ducked through thickets of blackberry and gorse. Every few minutes she stopped to listen, and each time the sounds of pursuit were fainter. At last they dwindled into silence. Her terror receded, but she knew it was still dangerous to leave the shelter of the forest. She found the densest stretch of thorns and crept into it, crawling on her belly until she was hidden. Then she burrowed into the dead leaves until only her mouth and eyes were showing, so she could watch the clearing she had just left. She lay there, panting and trembling. Gradually she calmed down, and lay without moving until the shadows of the trees stretched long upon the earth. Eventually, when there were still no more sounds of her hunters, she began to crawl back towards the clearing. She was just about to stand up when her nose wrinkled and she sniffed the air. She caught a whiff of tobacco smoke and sank down again, pressing herself to the earth. Her terror returned at full strength. After many silent, tense minutes, she lifted her head slowly. At the far side of the clearing, a man sat with his back to the trunk of the tallest beech tree. He was smoking a long-stemmed clay pipe, but his eyes roved from side to side. She recognised him instantly. It was the man in the plumed hat who had first spotted her, and who had led the chase. He was so close that she could hear every puff he took on his pipe. She buried her face in the leaf mould and tried to still her trembling. She did not know what he would do to her if he discovered her, but she sensed that it would be beyond her worst nightmares. She lay and listened to the suck and gurgle of his spittle in the bowl of the pipe, and her terror mounted. Suddenly he hawked and spat a glob of thick mucus. She heard it splatter close to her head, and her nerve almost broke. It was only by exerting all her courage and self-discipline that she stopped herself jumping to her feet and running again. Time seemed to stand still, but at last she felt the air turn cold on her bare arms. Still she did not lift her head. Then she heard rustling in the leaves and heavy footsteps coming directly towards her across the clearing. They stopped close by her head, and a great bull voice bellowed so close to her that her heart seemed to clench and freeze. "'There you are! I can see you! I'm coming! Run! You'd better run!' Her frozen heart came to life and hammered against her ribs, but she forced herself not to move. There was another long silence, then the footsteps walked away from where she lay. As he went, she could hear him muttering to himself, "'Dirty little whore! She probably riddled with the pox, anyway!' She lay without moving until the darkness was complete, and she heard an owl hoot in the top of the beech tree. Then she stood up and crept through the woods, starting and trembling at every rustle and scurry of the small night creatures. She did not leave the cottage again for some days. During the day she immersed herself in her father's books. There was one in particular that fascinated her, and she read it from the first page to the last, then started again at the beginning. The title was In Darkest Africa. The tales of strange animals and savage tribes enchanted her and whiled away the long days. She read of great hairy men that lived in the tops of the trees, of a tribe that ate the flesh of other men, and of tiny pygmies with a single eye in the centre of their foreheads. Reading became the opiate for her fears. 
One evening she fell asleep at the kitchen table, her golden head on the open book, the flame fluttering in the lamp. A glimmer of the light showed through the uncurtained window, and from there through a chink in the hedge. Two dark figures who were passing on the road stopped and exchanged a few hoarse words. Then they crept through the gate in the hedge. One went to the front door of the cottage, while the other circled round to the back. "'Who are you?' The harsh bellow brought Louisa awake and on her feet in the same instant. "'We know you're in there. Come out now!' She darted to the back door and struggled with the locking bar, then threw open the door and dashed out into the night. At that moment a heavy masculine hand fell on the back of her neck, and she was lifted by the scruff with her feet dangling and kicking as if she were a newborn kitten. The man who held her opened the shutter of the bull's-eye lantern he carried and shone the beam into her face. "'Who are you?' he demanded. In the lamplight she recognised his red face and bushy whiskers. "'Yun!' she squeaked. "'It's me, Louisa! Louisa Lofen!' Yun was the von Ritter's footman. The belligerence in his expression faded, slowly replaced by amazement. "'Little Louisa, is it really you? We all thought that you must be dead with the rest of them.' A few days later, Jan travelled with Louisa to Amsterdam in a cart containing some of the salvaged possessions of the Van Ritter's family. When he led her into the kitchens of the Huis Brabant, the servants who had survived crowded round to welcome her. Her prettiness, her sweet manner and sunny nature had always made her a favourite in the servants' quarters, so they grieved with her when they heard that Anne and Hendrik were dead. They could hardly believe that little Louisa, at just ten, had survived without her parents or friends, and had done so on her own resources and resolve. Elise, the cook, who had been a dear friend of her mother, immediately took her under her protection. Louisa had to tell her tale again and again as news of her survival spread, and the other servants, the workers and seamen from the Van Ritter's ships and warehouses, came to hear it. Every week, Stulz, the butler and major-domo of the household, wrote a report to Meneer van Ritters in London, where he had taken refuge from the plague with the remainder of his family. At the end of one report he mentioned that Louisa, the schoolmaster's daughter, had been rescued. Meneer was gracious enough to reply, "'See that the child is taken in and set to work in the household. You may pay her as a scullery maid. When I return to Amsterdam I shall decide what is to be done with her.' In early December, when the cold weather cleansed the city of the last traces of the plague, Meneer van Ritters brought home his family. His wife had been carried away by the plague, but her absence would make no difference to their lives. Out of the twelve children, only five had survived the pestilence. One morning, when Meneer van Ritters had been over a month in Amsterdam and had attended to all the more pressing matters that awaited his attention, he ordered Stolz to bring Louisa to him. She hesitated in the doorway to Meneer van Ritter's library. He looked up from the thick leather-bound ledger in which he was writing. "'Come in, child,' he ordered. "'Come here where I can see you.' Stulz led her to stand in front of the great man's desk. She curtsied to him, and he nodded approval. "'Your father was a good man, and he taught you manners.' He got up and went to stand in front of the tall bay windows. For a minute he looked out through the diamond panes at one of his ships unloading bales of cotton from the Indies into the warehouse. Then he turned back to study Louisa. She had grown since last he had seen her, and her face and limbs had filled out. He knew that she had had the plague, but she had recovered well. There were no traces on her face of the ravages of the disease. She was a pretty girl. Very pretty indeed, he decided and it was not an insipid beauty. Her expression was alert and intelligent, her eyes were alive and sparkled with the blue of precious sapphires, her skin was creamy and unblemished, but her hair was her most attractive attribute. She wore it in two long plaits that hung forward over her shoulders. He asked her a few questions. She tried to hide her fear and awe of him, and to answer in a sensible manner. "'Are you attending your lessons, child?' I have all my father's books, Meneer. 
I read every night before I sleep. What work are you doing? I wash and peel the vegetables, and I knead the bread and help Peter wash and dry the pots and pans, Manier. Are you happy? Oh, yes, Manier. Elise de Cook is so kind to me, like my own mother. I think we can find something more useful for you to do. Van Ritter stroked his beard thoughtfully. Elise and Stulz had lectured Louisa on how to behave when she was with him. Remember always that he is one of the greatest men in all the land. Always call him your excellency or menier. Curtsy when you greet him and when you leave. Do exactly what he tells you. If he asks a question, answer him directly, but never answer back. Stand straight and don't slump. Keep your hands clasped in front of you and do not fidget or pick your nose. There had been so many instructions that they had confused her. But now as she stood in front of him, her courage returned. He was dressed in cloth of the finest quality and his collar was of snowy lace. The buckles on his shoes were pure silver and the hilt of the dagger on his belt was gold set with glowing rubies. He was tall and his legs in black silk hose were as shapely and as well turned as a man half his age. Although his hair was touched with silver, it was dense and perfectly curled and set. His beard was almost entirely silver, but neatly barbered and shaped in the Van Dyke style. There were light laughter lines around his eyes, but the back of his hand, as he stroked his pointed beard, was smooth and unmarred by the blotches of age. He wore an enormous ruby on his forefinger. Despite his grandeur and dignity, his gaze was kind. Somehow she knew she could trust him, just as she could always trust gentle Jesus to look after her. Gertrude needs someone to look after her, Van Ritters reached a decision. Gertrude was his youngest surviving daughter. She was seven years old, a plain, simple-witted, petulant girl. You will be her companion and help her with her lessons. I know you are a bright girl. Louisa's spirits fell. She had grown so close to Elise, the motherly woman who had replaced Anne as head cook in the kitchen. She did not want to forsake the aura of warmth and security that cosseted her in the servants' quarters and have to go upstairs to care for the whining Gertrude. She wanted to protest, but Elise had warned her not to answer back. She hung her head and curtsied. Stultz, see that she is properly dressed. She will be paid as junior nursemaid and have a room to herself near the nursery. Van Ritters dismissed them and went back to his desk. Louisa knew she would have to make the best of her circumstances. There was no alternative. Manier was the lord of her universe. She knew that if she tried to pit herself against his dictates, her suffering would be endless. She set herself to win over Gertruda. It was not easy, for the younger girl was demanding and unreasonable. Not content with having Louisa as a slave during the day, she would scream for her in the night when she woke from a nightmare, or even when she wanted to use the chamber pot. Always uncomplaining and cheerful, Louisa gradually won her over. She taught her simple games, sheltered her from the bullying of her brothers and sisters, sang to her at bedtime, or read her stories. When she was haunted by nightmares, Louisa crawled into her bed, took her in her arms, and rocked her back to sleep. Gradually, Gertruda abandoned the role of Louisa's tormentor. Her own mother had been a remote, veiled figure whose face she could not remember. Gertruda had found a substitute, and she followed Louisa about with puppy-like trust. Soon Louisa was able to control her wild tantrums when she rolled howling on the floor, hurled her food against the wall, or tried to throw herself out of the windows into the canal. Nobody had been able to do this before, but with a quiet word Louisa would calm her, then take her by the hand and lead her back to her room. Within minutes she was laughing and clapping her hands and reciting the chorus of a children's rhyme with Louisa. At first Louisa felt only a sense of duty and obligation towards Gertruda, but slowly this turned to affection and then to a type of motherly love. Menier van Ritters became aware of the change in his daughter. On his occasional visits to nursery and classroom, he often singled out Louisa for a kind word. At the Christmas party for the children, he watched Louisa dancing with her charge. 
She was as supple and graceful as Gertruda was dumpy and ungainly. Van Ritter's smiled when Gertruda gave Louisa a pair of tiny pearl earrings as her Christmas present, and Louisa kissed and hugged her. A few months later, Van Ritter's called Louisa to his library. For a while he discussed the progress that she was making with Gertruda and told her how pleased he was with her. When she was leaving, he touched her hair. "'You are growing into such a lovely young woman. I must be careful that some oaf does not try to take you from us.' Gertruda and I need you here. Louisa was almost overcome by his condescension. On Louisa's thirteenth birthday, Gertruda asked her father to give her a special birthday treat. Van Ritters was taking one of his elder sons to England, where he was to enter the great university at Cambridge, and Gertruda asked if she and Louisa might go with the party. Indulgently, Van Ritters agreed. They sailed on one of the Van Ritter's ships and spent most of that summer visiting the great cities of England. Louisa was enchanted by her mother's homeland and took every opportunity to practice the language. The Van Ritter's party stayed for a week in Cambridge as Meneer wanted to see his favourite son settled in. He hired all the rooms at the Red Boar, the finest tavern in the university town. As usual, Louisa slept on a bed in the corner of Gertruda's room. She was dressing one morning, and Gertruda was sitting on her bed chattering to her. Suddenly she reached out and pinched Louisa's bosom. "'Look, Louisa, you are growing titties!' Gently Louisa removed her hand. In the last few months she had developed the stony lumps under her nipples that heralded the onset of puberty. Her breast buds were swollen, tender and sensitive. Gertruda's touch had been rough. "'You must not do that, Gertie, my shot. It hurts me, and that's an ugly word you used. I'm sorry, Louisa, tears formed in the child's eyes. I didn't mean to hurt you. It's all right, Louisa kissed her. Now what do you want for breakfast? Cakes. The tears were immediately forgotten. Lots of cakes with cream and strawberry jam. Then afterwards we can go to the Punch and Judy show, Louisa suggested. Oh, can we, Louisa, can we really? When Louisa went to ask Meneer van Ritter's permission for the outing, he decided on an impulse to accompany them. In the carriage, Gertruda, in her unpredictable fashion, returned to the morning's topic. She announced in a penetrating tone, "'Louisa has got pink titties. The tips stick out.' Louisa lowered her eyes and whispered, "'I told you, Gertie, that's a rude word. You promised not to use it again.' "'I am sorry, Louisa, I forgot.' Gertruda looked stricken. Louisa squeezed her hand. "'I'm not cross-shut. I just want you to behave like a lady.' Van Ritters seemed not to have overheard the exchange. He did not look up from the book that was open on his knee. However, during the puppet show, when the hook-nosed Punch was beating his shrieking wife about the head with a club, Louisa glanced sideways and saw that Menier was studying the tender swellings beneath her blouse. She felt the blood rush to her cheeks and drew her shawl more closely around her shoulders. It was autumn when they sailed on the return journey to Amsterdam. On the first night at sea, Gertruda was prostrate with seasickness. Louisa nursed her and held the basin for her as she retched. At last she fell into a deep sleep and Louisa escaped from the fetid cabin. Longing for a breath of fresh sea air, she hurried up the companionway to the deck. She stopped in the hatchway as she spotted the tall, elegant figure of Van Ritters standing alone on the quarter-deck. The officers and crew had left the windward rail to him. As the ship's owner, this was his prerogative. She would have gone below again immediately, but he saw her and called her to him. "'How is my Gertie?' Uh, "'She is sleeping, Meneer. I am sure that she will feel much better in the morning. At that moment, a larger wave lifted the ship's hull, and she rolled sharply. Taken off balance, Louisa was thrown against him. He put an arm around her shoulders. I am so sorry, Manier, her voice was husky. I slipped. She tried to draw back, but his arm held her firmly. She was confused, unsure what she should do next. She dared not pull away again. 
He made no move to release her, and then she could hardly credit her senses. She felt his other hand close on her right breast. She gasped and shivered as she felt him roll her tender, swollen nipple between his fingers. He was gentle, unlike his daughter had been. He did not hurt her at all. With a terrible, burning shame, she realized she was enjoying his touch. "'I am cold,' she whispered. "'Yes,' he said. "'You must go below before you catch a chill.' He released her and turned back to lean on the rail. Sparks streamed from the tip of his cheroot and blew away in the wind. When they returned to Heus Brabant, she did not see him again for several weeks. She heard Stoltz telling Elise that Meunier had gone to Paris on business. However, the brief incident on shipboard was never far from her mind. Sometimes she woke in the night and lay awake, burning with shame and remorse as she relived it. She felt that what had happened was her fault. A great man like Meunier von Ritter's surely could not be to blame. When she thought about it, her nipples burned and itched strangely. She felt a great evil in her, and climbed out of her bed to kneel and pray, shivering on the bare wooden floor. Gertruda called out in the dark, "'Louisa, I need the chamber-pot!' With a sense of relief, Louisa went to her before she could wet the bed. Over the following weeks the guilt faded, but never quite left her. Then, one afternoon, Stultz came to find her in the nursery. "'Meneer van Ritters wants to see you. You must go at once. I hope you have not done anything wrong, girl.' As Louisa brushed her hair hurriedly, she told Gertruda where she was going. "'Can I come with you? You must finish painting the picture of the boat for me. Try to stay inside the lines, my scut. I will be back soon.' She knocked on the door of the library, her heart racing wildly. She knew he was going to punish her for what had happened on the ship. He might have her beaten by the grooms, like they had done to the drunken nursemaid. Worse still, he might dismiss her, have her thrown out into the street— "'Come in,' his voice was stern. She curtsied in the doorway. "'You sent for me, Menir. "'Yes, come in, Louisa.' She stopped in front of his desk, but he gestured for her to come round and stand beside him. "'I want to talk to you about my daughter.' Instead of his usual black coat and lace collar, he wore a dressing robe of heavy Chinese silk that buttoned up the front. From this informal attire and his calm, friendly expression, she realized he was not angry with her. She felt a rush of relief. He was not going to punish her. His next words confirmed this. "'I was thinking that it might be time for Gertruda to begin riding lessons. You are a good horsewoman. I have seen you helping the grooms to exercise the horses. I want to hear your opinion.' "'Oh, uh, yes, Minya, I'm sure Gertie would love it.' "'Old Bumble is a gentle gelding.' "'Happily she started to help him develop the plan. "'She was standing close to his shoulder. "'A thick book with a green leather cover "'was lying on the desk in front of him. "'Casually he opened it. "'She could not avoid seeing the exposed page, "'and her voice trailed away. "'She lifted both hands to her mouth "'as she looked at the illustration "'that filled the whole of one folio-sized page.' It was obviously the work of a skilled artist. The man in the painting was young and handsome. He lolled back in a leather armchair. A pretty young girl stood in front of him laughing, and Louisa saw that she might have been her own twin. The girl's large, wide-set eyes were cerulean blue, and she was holding her skirts up to her waist so that the man could see the golden nest between her thighs. The artist had emphasized the pair of swollen lips that pouted at him through the curls. That was enough to stop her breath. But there was worse, far worse. The front flap of the man's breeches was undone, and through the opening thrust a pale shaft with a pink head. The man was holding it lightly between his fingers and seemed to be aiming it at the girl's rosy opening. Louisa had never seen a man naked. Even though she had listened to the other girls in the servants' quarters discussing it with gusto, she had not expected anything remotely like this. She stared at it in dreadful fascination, unable to tear her eyes away. 
She felt hot waves of blood rising up her throat and flooding her cheeks. She was consumed with shame and horror. "'I thought the girl looked like you, although not as pretty,' said Van Ritters quietly. "'Don't you agree, my dear?' "'I... I, I don't know,' she whispered. Her legs almost folded under her as she felt Mynheer Van Ritter's hand settle lightly on her bottom. The touch seemed to burn her flesh through the petticoats. He cupped her small round buttock, and she knew she should ask him to stop or run from the room, but she could not. Stals and Elise had warned her repeatedly that she must obey Mynheer always. She stood paralysed. She belonged to him like any of his horses or dogs. She was one of his chattels. She must submit to him without protest, even though she was not sure what he was doing, what he wanted from her. Of course, Rembrandt has taken some artistic license when it comes to dimensions. She could not believe that the artist who had painted the figure of God had also painted this picture. Yet it was possible. Even a famous artist must do what the great man required of him. Forgive me, gentle Jesus, she prayed, and shut her eyes tightly so that she did not have to look at that wicked picture. She heard the rustle of stiff silk brocade, and he said, Dear Louisa, this is what it really looks like. Her eyelids were clenched tightly, and he ran his hand over her buttock, gently but insistently. You are a big girl now, Louisa. It is time you knew these things. Open your eyes, my dear. Obediently she opened them a crack. She saw that he had undone the front of his robe, and that he wore nothing under it. She stared at the thing that stood proud through the folds of silk. The painting was a bland and romanticised representation of it. It rose massively from a nest of coarse dark hair and seemed as thick as her wrist. The head was not an insipid pink, as in the painting, but the colour of a ripe plum. The slit in the end of it glared at her like a cyclopean eye. She shut her eyes again tightly. Gertrude, she whispered. I, I promised to take her for a walk. You are very good to her, Louisa. His voice had a strange husky edge to it that she had never heard before. But now you must be good to me also. He reached down and under her skirts then ran his fingers up her naked legs. He lingered at the soft dimples at the back of her knees, and she trembled more violently. His touch was caressing and strangely reassuring. But she knew it was wrong. She was confused by these contrary emotions, and she felt as though she was suffocating. His fingers left the soft back of her knees and moved up her thigh. The touch was neither furtive nor hesitant, but authoritative not something she could deny or oppose. "'You must be good to me,' he had said, and she knew that he had every right to ask that of her. She owed him everything. If this was being good to him, then she had no choice. Yet she knew it was wicked, and that Jesus would punish her. Perhaps he would cease to love her for what they were doing. She heard the rustle of the page as he turned it with his free hand, and then he said, "'Look!' She tried to resist him in this at least, and shut her eyes again. His touch became more demanding, and his hand moved up to the crease where her buttock joined the back of her thigh. She opened her eyes just a fraction, and looked through her lashes at the fresh page of the book. Then her eyes flew wide open. The girl who looked so like her was kneeling in front of her swain. Her skirts had hiked up behind her and her exposed bottom was round and buttery. Both she and the boy were gazing down into his lap. The girl's expression was fond, as though she were looking down at a beloved pet, a kitten, perhaps. She held it clasped in both her small hands, but her dainty fingers were not able to encompass its girth. "'Is it not a beautiful picture?' he asked and despite the wickedness of the subject, she felt a strange empathy towards the young couple. They were smiling, and it seemed as though they loved each other and were enjoying what they were doing. She forgot to close her eyes again. You see, Louisa, that God has made men and women differently. On their own they are incomplete, but together 
they make a hole. She was not sure exactly what he meant, but sometimes she had not understood what her father had told her or the sermon preached by the Duomini. That is why the couple in the painting are so happy, and why you can see that they feel full of love for each other. With gentle authority his fingers moved between her legs, right up to the juncture of her thighs. Then he did something else to her there. She was not sure what it was, but she moved her feet apart so he could do it more easily. The sensation that overtook her was beyond anything she had experienced before. She could feel the happiness and love he had spoken about spreading out and suffusing her entire body. She stared down again into the opening of his robe, and her feelings of shock and fear faded. She saw that, like the picture in the book, it was really quite pleasing. No wonder the other girl looked at it like that. He moved her gently, and she was pliant and unresisting. Still sitting in the chair, he turned towards her and at the same time drew her closer and placed one hand on her shoulder. She understood instinctively that he wanted her to do what the girl in the picture was doing. Under the pressure of the hand on her shoulder, she sank down to her knees, and that strangely ugly, beautiful thing that was only inches from her face. Like the other girl, she reached out and took it in her hands. She made a small grunting sound, and she felt how hot and hard it was. It fascinated her. She squeezed gently and felt a leap of life as though this thing had a separate existence. It belonged to her, and she felt a strange sense of power as though she held the core of his being in her hands. He reached down and placed his own hands over hers. He began to move them back and forth. At first she was not sure what he was doing, then understood that he was showing her what he wanted. She felt a strong desire to please him, and she learned quickly. While she moved her fingers as rapidly as a weaver working at the loom, he lay back in the chair and groaned. She thought she had hurt him, and she tried to stand up, but he stopped her with the hand on her shoulder again, and a desperate tone in his voice said, No, Louisa, just like that. Don't stop what you're doing. Oh, you're such a good, clever girl. Suddenly he let out a deep, shuddering sigh and whipped a scarlet silk kerchief out of the pocket of his robe, covering his lap and both her hands with it. She did not want to let go of him, even when she felt a hot, viscous fluid pouring over her hands and soaking the silk cloth. When she tried to keep on with what she was doing, he grasped her wrists and held her hand still. "'That's enough, my dear. You have made me very happy.' After a long time he roused himself. He took her little hands one at a time and wiped them clean with the silk cloth. She felt no sense of revulsion. He was smiling at her kindly, and he told her, I am very pleased with you, but you must not tell anyone what we did today. Do you understand, Louisa? She nodded vehemently. The guilt had evaporated, and she felt instead gratitude and reverence. Now you can go back to Gertruda. We will begin her riding lessons tomorrow. Of course, you will take her to the academy. Over the next few weeks, Louisa saw him only once, and at a distance. She was halfway up the staircase on her way to Gertruda's room, when a footman opened the doors to the banquet room, and Meneer van Ritters led out a procession of his guests. They were all beautifully dressed, prosperous-looking ladies and gentlemen. Louisa knew at least four of the men were members of Het Seventeen, the directors of the VOC. They had obviously dined well and were jovial and noisy. She hid behind the curtains as they passed below her, but she watched Meneer van Ritters with a strange feeling of longing. He was wearing a long, curled wig and the sash and the star of the Order of the Golden Fleece. He was magnificent. Louisa felt a rare flash of hatred for the smiling, elegant woman on his arm. After they had passed her hiding place, she ran to the room she shared with Gertruda, threw herself on the bed and wept. Why does he not want to see me again? Did I displease him? She thought about the incident in the library every day, especially after the lantern was out and she was in her bed across the room from Gertruda. 
Then one day, Mynheer von Ritters arrived unexpectedly at the riding academy. Louisa had taught Gertruda how to curtsy. She was awkward and clumsy, and Louisa had to help her back onto her feet when she lost her balance. But von Ritters smiled a little at this accomplishment and returned the courtesy with a playful bow. "'Your devoted servant,' he said, and Gertruda giggled. He did not speak directly to Louisa, and she knew better than to address him uninvited. He watched Gertruda make a circuit of the ring on the lead rein. Louisa had to walk beside the pony, and Gertruda's pudding face was screwed up with terror. Then Van Ritters left as abruptly as he had appeared. Another week passed, and Louisa was torn with opposing emotions. At times the magnitude of her sin returned to plague her. She had allowed him to touch and play with her and she had taken pleasure in handling that monstrous thing of his. She had even begun to have the most vivid dreams about it, and she woke in confusion, her newly-fledged breasts and her private parts burning and itching. As though in punishment for her sins, her breasts had swelled until they strained the buttons of her blouse. She tried to hide them, keeping her arms crossed over her chest, but she had seen the stable boys and the footmen looking at them, she wanted to talk to Elise about what had happened to her, and asked her advice, but Mynheer van Ritters had warned her against this, so she kept silent. Then, unexpectedly, Stolz told her, "'You are to move to your own room. It is the Mynheer's order.' Louisa stared at him in astonishment. "'But what about Gertrude? She can't sleep alone.' "'The master thinks it's time she learned to do so.' She, too, will have a new room, and you will have the one beside her. She will have a bell to call you if she needs you in the night. The girls' new apartments were on the floor below the library and the Meneer's bedroom suite. Louisa made a game of the move and stilled Gertruda's misgivings. They took all her dolls up and held a party for them to introduce them to their new quarters. Louisa had learned to speak in a different voice for each toy, a trick that never failed to reduce Gertruda to shrieks of laughter. When each of her dolls, in turn, had told Gertruda how happy they were with their new home, she was convinced. Louisa's own room was light and spacious. The furnishings were quite splendid, with velvet curtains and gilt chairs and bedstead. There was a feather mattress on the bed and thick blankets. There was even a fireplace with a marble surround, although Stoltz cautioned her that she would be rationed to a single bucket of coal a week. But, wonder of wonders, there was a tiny cubicle that contained a commode with a lid that lifted to reveal a carved seat and the porcelain chamber pot under it. Louisa was in a haze of delight as she crept into bed that first night. It seemed that she had never been warm in her life until this evening. She came out of a deep, dreamless sleep, and lay awake trying to place what had woken her. It must have been well past midnight, for it was dark, and the house was silent. Then the sound came again, and her heart raced. It was footsteps, but they came from the panelled wall at the far side of the room. She was gripped by superstitious dread, and could neither move nor scream. Then she heard the creak of a door opening, and a ghostly light glowed out of nowhere. Slowly a panel in the far wall swung wide open, and a spectral figure stepped into the room. It was a tall, bearded man dressed in breeches and a white shirt with leg of mutton sleeves and a high stock. Louisa! His voice was hollow and echoed strangely. It was just the voice that she would have expected from a ghost. She pulled the covers over her head and lay without breathing. She heard footsteps crossing to her bedside, and she could see the wavering light through a slit in the bedclothes. The footsteps stopped beside her, and suddenly her coverings were flung back. This time she screamed, but she knew it was futile. Next door Gertruda would be sleeping in a mindless stupor from which nothing short of an earthquake could waken her, and there were only the two of them on this floor of Heus Brabant. She stared at the face above her, so far gone in terror that she did not recognize him, even in the lantern light. Don't be afraid, child, I will not hurt you. Oh, Mynheer! She flung herself against his chest and clung to him with all the strength of her relief. I thought that you were a ghost. There, child, he stroked her hair. It's all over. There is nothing to be afraid of. It took her a long time to become calm again. Then he said, I won't leave you here alone. 
Come bit me. He took her hand, and she followed him trustingly in her cotton nightdress on bare feet. He led her through the door in the panel. A spiral staircase was concealed behind it. They went up it, then through another secret doorway. Suddenly they were in a magnificent chamber, so spacious that even with fifty candles burning in their chandeliers, the far reaches of the room and the ceilings were in shadow. He led her to the fireplace in which tall yellow flames leapt and twisted. He embraced her and stroked her hair. Did you think I had forgotten you? She nodded. I thought I had made you angry, and that you did not like me any more. He chuckled and lifted her face to the light. <laughs> what a beautiful little thing you are. This is how angry I am and how much I dislike you. He kissed her mouth, and she tasted the cheroot on his lips, a strong aromatic flavour that made her feel safe and secure. At last he broke the embrace and seated her on the sofa in front of the fire. He went to a table on which stood crystal glasses and a decanter of ruby-red liquor. He poured a glass and brought it to her. Drink this. It will chase away the bad thoughts. She choked and coughed at the sting of the liquor, but then a marvellous glow spread through her, to her toes and fingertips. He sat beside her, stroked her hair, and spoke to her softly, telling her how pretty she was, what a good girl, and how he had missed her. Lulled by the warmth in her belly, and his mesmeric voice, she leaned her head on his chest. He lifted the hem of her nightdress over her head, and she wriggled out of it. Then she was naked. In the candlelight her childlike body was pale and smooth as cream in a jug. She felt no shame as he fondled her and kissed her face. She turned this way and that at the gentle urging of his hands. Suddenly he stood up and she watched him as he pulled off his shirt and breeches. When he came back to the sofa and stood in front of her, he did not have to guide her hands, and she reached for him naturally. She gazed at his sex as she slid back the loose skin to reveal the shiny plum-coloured head, as he had taught her. Then he reached down, removed her hands, and sank to the floor in front of her. He pushed apart her knees and laid her back on the velvet-covered sofa. He lowered his face and she felt his moustache tickling the inside of her thighs, then moving higher. "'What are you doing?' she cried with alarm. He had not done this before, and she tried to sit up. He held her down, and suddenly she cried out and sank her fingernails into his shoulders. His mouth had settled on her most secret parts. The sensation was so intense that she feared for a moment she might faint. It was not every night that he came down the spiral staircase to fetch her. On many nights there was the rumble of carriage wheels on the cobbled streets below Louise's window. She blew out her candle and peeped through the curtains to watch Mynheer van Ritter's guests arriving for another banquet or fashionable soiree. Long after they had left, she lay awake, hoping to hear his footsteps on the staircase. But she was usually disappointed. For weeks or even months at a time he was gone, sailing on one of his fine ships to places with strange and evocative names. While he was gone, she was restless and bored. She found that she was even impatient with Gertruda and unhappy with herself. When he came back, his presence filled the great house, and even the other servants were enlivened and excited by it. Suddenly all the waiting and pining were as if they had never happened, as she heard him descending the staircase, and leapt from her bed to meet him as he stepped through the secret door in the panelling. After that he devised a signal to summon her to his chamber, so that he no longer had to come down to fetch her. At dinner-time he would send a footman to deliver a red rose to Gertruda. None of the servants who delivered the bloom thought it odd. They all knew that Mynheer had an inexplicable affection for his ugly, slow-witted daughter, but on those nights the door at the top of the spiral staircase was unlocked, and when Louisa stepped through, he was waiting for her. These meetings were never the same. Every time he invented some new game for them to act out. He made her dress in fantastic costumes, 
play the role of milkmaid, stable boy, or princess. Sometimes he made her wear masks, the heads of demons and wild animals. On other evenings they would study the pictures in the green book and then enact the scenes they depicted. The first time he showed her the picture of the girl lying under the boy and his shaft buried in her to the hilt. She did not believe it was possible. But he was gentle, patient, and considerate, so that when it happened there was little pain and only a few drops of her virgin blood on the sheets of the wide bed. Afterwards she felt a great sense of accomplishment, and when she was alone she studied her lower body with awe. It amazed her that the parts she had been taught were unclean and sinful could be the seat of such delights. She was convinced now that there was nothing more that he could teach her. She believed that she had been able to pleasure him and herself in every conceivable way. But she was wrong. He went away on one of his seemingly interminable voyages, this time to a place called St. Petersburg in Russia, to visit the court of Poitre Alexeyevich, whom other men called Peter the Great, and to expand his interests in the trade in precious furs. When he returned, Louisa was in a fever of excitement, and this time she did not have long to wait for his summons. That evening a footman delivered a single red rose to Gertruda, while Louisa was cutting up her roasted chicken. "'Why are you so happy, Louisa?' Gertruda demanded as she danced around the bedroom. "'Because I love you, Gertie, and I love everybody in the world,' Louisa sang. Gertruda clapped her hands. "'And I love you too, Louisa. "'Now it's time for your bed, and here is a cup of hot milk to make you sleep tight.' That evening, when Louisa stepped through the secret doorway into Menier van Ritter's bedchamber, she stopped dead in astonishment. This was a new game, and she was at once confused and frightened. This was too real, too terrifying. Meneer van Ritter's head was concealed with a tight-fitting black leather hood, with round cut-out eye-holes and a crude gash for a mouth. He wore a black leather apron and shiny black boots that reached to the top of his thighs. His arms were folded across his chest, and his hands were covered with black gloves. She could barely tear her gaze away from him to look at the sinister structure that stood in the centre of the floor. It was identical to the flogging tripod on which miscreants received public punishment in the square outside the law courts. However, in place of the usual chains, silk ropes dangled from the top of the tripod. She smiled at him with trembling lips, but he stared back at her impassively through the eye-holes in the black hood. She wanted to run, but he seemed to anticipate her intentions. He strode to the door and locked it. Then he placed the key in the front pocket of his apron. Her legs gave way under her, and she sank to the floor. "'I'm sorry,' she whispered. "'Please don't hurt me.' I have been sentenced for the sin of harlotry to twenty strokes of the whip. His voice was stern and harsh. Please let me go. I don't want to play this game. This is no game. He came to her, and though she pleaded with him for mercy, he lifted her and led her to the tripod. He tied her hands high above her head with the silken ropes, and she peered back at him over her shoulder, with her long yellow hair hanging over her face. "'What are you going to do to me?' He went to the table against the far wall, and with his back turned to her, picked up something. Then, with theatrical slowness, he turned back with the whip in his hand. She whimpered and tried to free herself from the silken bonds that pinioned her wrists, twisting and turning as she hung on the tripod, he came to her and placed one finger into the opening of her nightdress and ripped it down to the hem. He stripped away the tatters, and she was naked. He came to stand in front of her, and she saw a huge bulge under his leather apron, evidence of his arousal. Twenty strokes,' he repeated in the cold, hard voice of a stranger, "'and you will count each one as it falls. Do you understand? You want a little whore?' She winced at the word. Nobody had ever called her that before. I did not know I was doing wrong. I thought I was pleasing you. He cut the whip through the air, and the lash hissed close to her face. 
Then he went behind her, and she closed her eyes and tensed every muscle in her back, but still the pain of the stroke defied her belief, and she shrieked aloud. Count! he ordered, and through white, quivering lips she obeyed. One! she screamed. It went on and on, without pity or respite, until she fainted. He held a small green bottle under her nose, and the pungent fumes revived her. Then it started again. Count! he ordered. At last she was able to whisper, Twenty! And he laid the whip back on the table. He was loosening the strings of his leather apron as he came back to her. She hung on the silk ropes, unable to lift her head or support herself. Her back, her buttocks, and the tops of her legs felt as though they were on fire. He came up behind her, and she felt his hands on her lower body, drawing her red, throbbing buttocks apart. Then there was a pain more dreadful than any that had gone before it. She was being impaled in the most unnatural way, ripped apart. Agony tore through her bowels, and she found fresh strength to scream and scream again. At last he cut her down from the tripod, wrapped her in a blanket, and carried her down the staircase. Without another word, he left her sobbing on the bed. In the morning, when she tottered to the cubicle and sat on the commode, she found that she was still bleeding. Seven days later, she had still not healed completely, and another red rose was delivered to Gertruda. Trembling and weeping quietly, she climbed the staircase to answer his summons. When she entered his chamber, the tripod stood in the middle of the floor, and once again he wore the hood and apron of the executioner. It took months for her to gather her courage. But at last she went to Elise and told her how Mania was treating her. She lifted her dress and turned to show the welts and stripes across her back. Then she bent over and showed her the torn, festering opening. "'Cover yourself, you shameless strumpet!' Elise shouted and slapped her cheek. "'How dare you make up filthy lies about such a great man and good man! "'I shall have to report you to Menier for this, "'but in the meantime I will tell Stolz to lock you in the wine cellar.' "'For two days Louisa crouched on the stone floor in a dark corner of the cellar. "'The agony in her lower belly was a fire that threatened to consume her very soul. "'On the third day a sergeant and three men of the city watch came to fetch her. As they led her up the stairs to the kitchen yard, she looked for Gertruda, Elise, or Stolz. But there was no sign of them or any of the other servants. "'Thank you for coming to rescue me,' she told the sergeant. "'I could not have borne it another day.' He gave her an odd, enigmatic glance. "'We searched your room and found the jewellery you had stolen,' he said. "'What terrible ingratitude to a gentleman who treated you so kindly! We shall see what the magistrate has to say to you.' The magistrate was suffering from the effects of the previous evening's overindulgence. He had been one of fifty dinner guests at Huis Brabant, whose cellars and table were famous throughout the Low Countries. Kern van Ritters was an old friend, and the magistrate glowered at the young female prisoner arraigned before him. Kern had spoken to him about this hussy after last night's dinner, while they puffed on their cheroots and finished off a bottle of fine old cognac. He listened impatiently as the sergeant of the watch gave evidence against her and laid before the magistrate the package of stolen jewellery that they had found in her room. "'Prisoner is to be transported to the penal colony in Batavia for life,' the magistrate ordered. Het Golokke was lying in the harbour almost ready to sail. They marched Louisa from the courtroom directly to the docks. At the top of the gangplank she was met by the head jailer. He entered her name in the register, then two of his men locked leg irons on her ankles and shoved her down the hatchway to the gun deck. Now, almost a year later, the Mew lay at anchor in Table Bay. Even through the thick oaken planking Louisa heard the hail, Longboat with supplies, permission to hook on. She roused herself from her long reverie and peeped through the chink in the joint of the port lid. She saw the longboat being rowed towards the ship by a mixed crew of a dozen black and white men. There was a big broad-shouldered ruffian standing in the bows, and she started as she recognised the man at the tiller. It was the young one who had asked her name and thrown the fish to her. 
she had fought for possession of that precious gift, then divided it with her little blade and shared it with three other women. They were not her friends, for there were no friends aboard this ship, but early in the voyage the four had forged a pact of mutual protection for survival. They had gobbled down the fish raw, watchful of the other starving women who crowded round them, waiting for an opportunity to snatch a scrap. She remembered with longing the sweet taste of the raw fish as she watched the heavily laden longboat moor against the side of the ship. There was a hubbub of banging and shouting, the squeal of sheave blocks and more shouted orders. Through the chink she watched the baskets and boxes of fresh produce being swung on board. She could smell the fruit and the newly picked tomatoes. Saliva flooded her mouth. But she knew that most of this bounty would go to the officers' mess and what remained to the gunroom and the common seamen's kitchen. None of it would find its way down to the prison decks. The convicts would subsist on the weevily hard biscuit and the rotten salt pork crawling with maggots. Suddenly she heard someone banging on one of the other gun ports further down the deck. And a masculine voice from outside called softly but urgently, Louisa! Is Louisa there? Before she could answer, some of the other women howled and shouted back, Ya, yeah, my dotty, I am Louisa. Do you want a taste of my honey pot? And there were shrieks of laughter. Louisa recognised the man's voice. She tried to shout to him above the chorus of filth and invective, but her enemy swamped her with malicious glee, and she knew he would not hear her. With rising despair, she peered through her peephole, but the view was restricted. "'I am here!' she shouted in Dutch. "'I am Louisa!' Abruptly, his face rose into her view. He must have been standing on one of the thwarts of the longboat that was moored below her gunport. Louisa? He put his eye to the other side of the chink, and they stared at each other from a range of a few inches. Yes, he laughed unexpectedly. Blue eyes! Bright blue eyes! Who are you? What is your name? On impulse she spoke in English, and he gaped at her. You speak English? No, you weak wit, it was Chinese, she snapped back at him, and he laughed again. By the sound of him he was overbearing and cocky but he was the only friendly voice she had heard in over a year. "'It's a saucy one you are. I've something else for you. Can you get this port lid open?' he asked. "'Are any of the guards watching from the deck?' she asked. "'They'll have me flogged if they see us talking.' "'No, we're hidden by the tumble home of the ship's side.' "'Wait,' she said, and drew the blade from her pouch. Quickly she prized out the single shackle that still held the lock in place. Then she leaned back, placed both bare feet against the port lid, and pushed with all her might. The hinges creaked, then gave a few inches. She saw his fingers at the edge, and he helped to pull it open a little wider. Then he thrust a small canvas bag through the opening. "'There's a letter for you,' he whispered, his face close to hers. "'Read it!' And then he was gone. Wait, she pleaded, and his face appeared in the opening again. You did not tell me. What is your name? Jim. Jim Courtney. Thank you, Jim Courtney, she said, and let the port lid thump shut. The three women crowded round her in a tight circle of protection as she opened the bag. Quickly they divided up the dried meat and the packets of hard biscuit, and gnawed at the unappetizing fare with desperate hunger. When she found the comb, tears came to Louisa's eyes. It was carved from dappled, honey-coloured tortoiseshell. She stroked it through her hair, and it glided smoothly, not pulling painfully like the ugly hand-whittled thing she'd been reduced to. Then she found the file and the knife wrapped together in a scrap of canvas— the knife was horn-handled, and the blade, when she tested it on her thumb, was keen, a fine weapon. The sturdy little file had three cutting edges. She felt a lift of hope, the first in all those long months. She looked down at the irons on her ankles. The skin beneath the cruel bonds were calloused. Knife and file were invaluable gifts, but it was the comb that touched her deepest. It was an affirmation that he had seen her as a woman, not as jail dregs from the slums and the gutter. She rummaged in the bottom of the bag for the letter he had promised. 
It was a single sheet of cheap paper folded cunningly to form its own envelope. It was addressed to Louisa, in a bold but fair hand. She unfolded it, careful not to tear it. It was in poorly spelt Dutch, but she was able to make out the gist of it. Use the file on your chains. I'll have a boat under the stern tomorrow night. When you hear the ship's bell strike two bells in the middle watch, jump. I will hear the splash. Have courage. Her pulse raced. At once she knew that the chances of success were negligible. A hundred things could go wrong, not least a musket ball or a shark. What matters was that she had found a friend and with it new hope of salvation, no matter how remote. She tore the note into shreds and dropped them into the reeking latrine bucket. None of the guards would try to retrieve it from there. Then she crept back under the cannon into the darkness that was her only privacy and sat with her legs folded under her so she could easily reach the links of her leg irons. With the first stroke of the little file she cut a shallow but bright notch and a few grains of iron filtered down to the deck. The shackles had been forged from untempered steel of poor quality, but it would take time and a heartbreaking perseverance to cut through a single link. I have a day and a night. Until two bells in the middle watch tomorrow night, she encouraged herself and laid the file into the notch she had already cut. At the next stroke, more iron filings dusted the deck. The longboat had been relieved of the heavy load of produce, and now she rowed lightly. Mansur was at the tiller, and Jim gazed back over the stern as he rowed. Every now and again he grinned as he went over in his mind the brief meeting with Louisa. She spoke English, good English, with only a touch of a Dutch accent, and she was spirited and quick-witted. She had responded swiftly to the circumstances. This was no dull-witted lump of jailbait. He had seen her bare legs through the chink in the port lid as she helped him prise it open. They were starved painfully thin and galled by her chains, but they were long and straight, not twisted and deformed by rickets. Good breeding there, as her father would say of a blood filly. The hand that had taken the canvas bag from his was grubby and the nails were cracked and broken, but it was beautifully shaped with gracefully tapered fingers. The hands of a lady, not a slave or scullery maid. She does not smell like a posy of lavender, but she's been locked up in that filthy tub for Lord alone knows how long. What do you expect? He made excuses for her. Then he thought about her eyes. Those wondrous blue eyes, and his expression was soft and dreamy. In all my life, I have never laid eyes on a girl like that. And she speaks English. Hey, cuz, Mansur shouted. Keep the stroke. You'll have us on Robben Island if you're not more careful. Jim started out of his daydream, just in time to meet the next swell that lifted the stern high. "'Sea's getting up,' his father grunted. "'Like as not, it'll be blowing a gale by tomorrow. We'll have to try to take out the last load before it gets too rough.' Jim took his eyes off the receding shape of the ship and looked beyond her. His spirits sank. The storm clouds were piling up high and heavy as mountains upon the horizon. "'I have to think up an excuse to stay ashore when they take out the next load to the mew,' he decided. "'There's not going to be another chance to make ready.' "'As the mules dragged the longboat up the beach, Jim told his father, "'I have to take Captain Hugo his cut. "'He might scotch us if he doesn't have some coin in his fat fist.' "'Oh, let him wait for it, the old sheep-thief. "'I need you to help me with the next shipment.' I promised Hugo, and anyway, you have a full crew for the next trip out to the ship. Tom Courtney studied his son with a searching gaze. He knew him well. He was up to something. It was not like Jim to shirk. On the contrary, he was a rock on which Tom could depend. It was he who had established good terms with the purser on the convict ship. He had obtained the license to trade from Hugo, and he had supervised the loading of the first shipment. He could be trusted. Well, I don't know. Tom stroked his chin dubiously. Mansur stepped in quickly. Let Jim go, Uncle Tom. I can take over from him for the time being. Very well, Jim. Go and visit your friend Hugo, Tom acquiesced. 
I'll be back on the beach to help with the boats when we return. Later, from the top of the dunes, Jim watched the longboats rowing back towards the Mew with the final load of produce. It seemed to him that the swells were higher than they had been that morning, and the wind was starting to claw off the tops in a parade of leaping white horses. God spare us, he said aloud. If the storm comes up, I'll not be able to get the girl off until it passes. Then he remembered his instructions to her. He had told her to jump overboard at precisely two bells in the middle watch. He could not get another message to her to stop her doing that. Would she have the good sense to stay on board if there was a full gale blowing, realising that he had not been able to keep the rendezvous, or would she throw herself overboard regardless and perish in the darkness? The thought of her drowning in the dark waters struck him like a fist in his belly, and he felt nauseous. He turned Drumfire's head towards the castle and pressed his heels into the horse's sides. Captain Hugo was surprised but pleased to have his commission paid so promptly. Jim left him without ceremony, refusing even a mug of coffee, and galloped back along the beach. He was thinking furiously as he rode. There had been so little time to lay his plans. It was only in the last few hours that he had been sure the girl had the spirit to chance such a hazardous escape. The first consideration, if he succeeded in getting her ashore, would be to find a safe hiding place for her. As soon as her escape was discovered, the entire castle garrison would be sent out to find her, a hundred infantry and squadron of cavalry. The company troops in the castle had little enough employment, and a manhunt, or better still, a woman hunt, would be one of the most exciting events in years. Colonel Kayser, the garrison commander, would be hot for the honour of capturing an escaped convict. For the first time he allowed himself to consider the consequences if this harebrained scheme fell to pieces. He worried that he might be making trouble for his family. The strict law laid down by the directors of the VOC, the almighty Seventeen in Amsterdam, was that no foreigner was permitted to reside or carry on a business in the colony. However, like so many other strict laws of the directors in Amsterdam, there were special circumstances by which they could be circumvented. Those special circumstances always involved a monetary token of esteem to His Excellency Governor van der Witten. It had cost the Courtney brothers 20,000 guilders to obtain a license to reside and trade in the colony of Good Hope. Van der Witten was unlikely to revoke that license. He and Tom Courtney were on friendly terms, and Tom contributed generously to van der Witten's unofficial pension fund. Jim hoped that if he and the girl simply disappeared from the colony, there would be nothing to implicate the rest of his family. There might be suspicions, and at the worst it might cost his father another gift to van der Witten, but in the end it would blow over, just as long as he never returned. There were only two avenues of escape from the colony. The natural and best was the sea, but that meant a boat. The Courtney brothers owned two armed traders, handy and fleet schooners with which they traded as far as Arabia and Bombay. However, at the present time both these vessels were at sea, and were not expected back until the monsoon changed, which would not be for several months yet. Jim had saved up a little money, perhaps enough to pay for a passage for the girl and himself on one of the ships lying in Table Bay at the moment, but the first thing Colonel Kayser would do as soon as the girl was reported missing was to send search parties aboard every ship. He could try to steal a small boat, a pinnace, perhaps, something seaworthy enough in which he and the girl could reach the Portuguese ports on the Mozambique coast, but every captain was alert for piracy. The most likely reward for his efforts would be a musket ball in his belly. Even in his most optimistic expectations, he had to face the fact that the sea route was closed to them. There was only one other still open, and he turned and looked northwards, at the far mountains on which the last of the winter snows had not yet thawed. He pulled up drum fire and thought about what lay out there. Jim had not travelled more than fifty leagues beyond those peaks, but he had heard of others who had gone further into the hinterland and returned with a great store of ivory. There was even a rumour of the old hunter who had picked a shiny pebble out of a sandbank of a nameless river far to the north and had sold the diamond in Amsterdam for a hundred thousand guilders. He felt his skin prickle with excitement. On countless nights he had dreamed of what lay beyond that blue horizon. He had discussed it with Mansur and Zama, 
and they had promised each other that one day they would make the journey. Had the gods of adventure overheard his boasts, and were they conspiring now to drive him out there into the wilderness? Would he have a girl with golden hair and blue eyes riding at his side? He laughed at the thought and urged Drumfire on. With his father, his uncle Dorian, and almost all the servants and freed slaves out of the way for the next few hours, he had to work quickly. He knew where his father kept the keys to both the strong room and the armory. He selected six strong mules out of the herd in the kraal, pack saddled them, and took them on a lead rein up to the rear doors of the godown. He had to choose carefully as he selected goods from the warehouse to make up the loads. A dozen best tower muskets and canvas ball pouches, kegs of black powder and lead bars and moulds to cast more ball, axes, knives and blankets, beads and cloth to trade with the wild tribes they might meet, basic medicines, pots and water bottles, needles and thread and all the other necessities of existence in the wilderness, but no luxuries. Coffee was not a luxury, he consoled himself as he added a sack of beans. When they were loaded, he led the string of mules away to a quiet place beside a stream in the forest almost two miles from High Weald. He relieved the animals of their packs so they could rest, and left them with knee halters to allow them to graze on the lush grass on the stream bank. By the time he returned to High Weald, the longboats were on their way back from the mew. He went down to meet his father, Mansur, and the returning crews as they came back over the dunes. He rode along with them and listened to their desultory conversation. They were all drenched with seawater and almost exhausted, for it had been a long haul back from the Dutch ship in the heavy seas. Mansur described it to him succinctly. You were lucky to get out of it. The waves were breaking over us like a waterfall. Did you see the girl? Jim whispered, so his father would not overhear. What girl? Mansur gave him a knowing glance. "'You know what, girl?' Jim punched his arm. Mansur's expression turned serious. "'They had all the convicts locked up and battened down. One of the officers told Uncle Tom that the captain is anxious to sail as soon as he can finish reprovisioning and filling his water butts. By tomorrow at the very latest, he does not want to be pinned down by the storm on this lee shore.' He saw Jim's despairing expression and went on sympathetically— "'Sorry, cuz, but like as not the ship will be gone by noon tomorrow. "'She would have been no good for you anyway, a convict woman. "'You know nothing about her. You don't know what crimes she's committed. "'Murder, perhaps. Let her go, Jim. Forget about her. "'There's more than one bird in the blue sky, "'more than a single blade of grass on the plains of Camdebu. "'Jim felt anger, flare, and bitter words rose to his lips, "'but he held them back. "'He left the others and turned drumfire towards the top of the dunes.' From the height he looked out across the bay. The storm was mounting even as he watched, bringing on the darkness prematurely. The wind moaned and ruffled his hair and whipped Drumfire's mane into a tangle. He had to shield his eyes against the sting of flying sand and spume. The surface of the sea was a welter of breaking white spray and tall heaving swells that rose up and crashed down on the beach. It was a wonder that his father had been able to bring the boats in through that turmoil of wind and water. But Tom Courtney was a master mariner. Almost two miles out, the mew was an indistinct grey shape that rolled and pitched with swinging bare masts, and disappeared as each fresh squall swept across the bay. Jim watched until the darkness hid her completely, then he galloped down the back of the dune towards High Weald. He found Zama still working in the stables, bedding down the horses. Come with me, he ordered, and obediently Zama followed him out into the orchard. When they were out of sight of the house, they squatted down side by side. They were silent for a while. Then Jim spoke in Lhotse, the language of the forests, so that Zama would know there were deadly serious matters to discuss. "'I am going,' he said. Zama stared into his face, but his eyes were hidden by the darkness. "'Where, Samoya?' he asked. Jim pointed with his chin towards the north. "'When will you return?' "'I do not know. Perhaps never,' said Jim. "'Then I must take leave of my father.' "'You're coming with me?' Jim asked. Zama glanced at him pityingly. No answer was needed to such a fatuous question. "'Aboli was a father to me also,' 
Jim stood up and placed an arm around his shoulder. Let us go to his grave. They climbed the hill in the intermittent lightning flashes, but they both had the night vision of youth, so they went swiftly. The grave was on the eastern slope, sighted deliberately to face each morning sunrise. Jim remembered every detail of the funeral. Tom Courtney had slaughtered a black bull, and Abberley's wives had stitched the old man's corpse into the wet hide. Then Tom had carried Abberley's once great body, shrunken now with age like a sleeping child, down into the deep shaft. He had sat him upright, then laid out all his weapons and his most treasured possessions around him. Lastly, the entrance to the shaft was sealed with a round boulder. It had taken two full spans of oxen to drag it into position. Now, in the darkness, Jim and Zama knelt before it and prayed to the tribal gods of the Lotzi, and to Abuli, who in death had joined that dark pantheon. The rolling thunder counterpointed their prayers. Zama asked his father for his blessing on the journey that lay ahead of them. Then Jim thanked him for teaching him the way of the musket and the sword, and reminded Abuli of when he had taken him to hunt his first lion. "'Protect us, your sons, as you shielded us that day,' he asked, "'for we go upon a journey we know not where.' Then the two sat with their backs against the gravestone, and Jim explained to Zama what he must do. "'I've loaded a string of mules. They are tethered by the stream. Take them up into the mountains to Majuba, the place of doves, and wait for me there.' Majuba was the rude hut, hidden in the foothills, that was used by the shepherds who took the Courtney flocks up to the high pastures in the summer, and by the men of the Courtney family when they went out to hunt the quacha, the eland and the bluebuck. It was deserted at this season of the year. They said their last farewells to the old warrior who sat eternally in the darkness behind the boulder, and went down to the clearing beside the stream in the forest. Jim took a lantern from one of the packs, and by its light helped Zama load the mules with the heavy packs. Then he set him on the path that led northwards into the mountains. "'I will come in two days, whatever happens. Wait for me!' Jim shouted as they parted, and Zama rode on alone. By the time Jim arrived back at High Wheel, the household was asleep, but Sarah, his mother, had kept his dinner warm for him on the back of the stove. When she heard him clattering the pots, she came down in her nightgown and sat to watch him eat. She said little, but her eyes were sad, and there was a droop at the corners of her mouth. "'God bless you, my son, my only son,' she whispered, as she kissed him good night. Earlier that day she had seen him lead away the mule train into the forest, and with a mother's instinct she had known he was leaving. She picked up the candle and climbed the stairs to the bedroom, where Tom snored peacefully. Jim slept little that night, while the wind buffeted the house and rattled the window frames. He was up long before the rest of the household. In the kitchen he poured a mug of bitter black coffee from the enamel kettle that always stood on the back of the stove. It was still dark as he went down to the stables and led out drumfire. He rode down to the seashore, and as he and the horse topped the dunes, the full force of the wind came at them out of the darkness like a ravening monster. He took drumfire back behind the shelter of the dunes and tethered him to a low salt bush, then climbed again on foot to the crest. He wrapped his cloak closer around his shoulders and pulled his wide-brimmed hat low over his eyes as he squatted and waited for the first show of dawn. He thought about the girl. She had shown herself to be quick-witted, but was she sensible enough to realise that no small boat could come out to the anchorage in the bay until the storm abated? Would she understand that he was not deserting her? The low scudding clouds delayed the dawn, and even when it broke it could hardly illuminate the wild scene before him. He stood up and had to lean into the wind as though he were crossing a fast-flowing river. He held onto his hat with both hands and searched for a glimpse of the Dutch ship. Then, far out, he saw a flash of something not as evanescent as the leaping foam and spray that strove to extinguish it. He watched it avidly, and it persisted, constant in this raging seascape. "'A sail!' he cried, 
and the wind tore the words from his lips. However, it was not where he had expected to find the Mew. This was a ship under sail, not lying at anchor. He must know if this was the Mew trying to fight her way out of the bay, or if it was one of the other ships that had been anchored there. His small hunting telescope was in his saddlebag. He turned and ran back through the soft sand to where he had left Drumfire out of the wind. When he reached the crest again, he searched for the ship. It took him minutes to find her, but then her sails flashed at him again. He sat flat in the sand, and using his knees and elbows like a tripod to steady himself against the buffeting of the wind, he trained the lens on the distant ship. He picked up her sails, but the swells obscured the hull until suddenly a freak combination of wave and wind lifted her high. It's her! There was no doubt left. Hedger, look at Mew! He was swamped by an enervating sense of doom. Before his eyes, Louisa was being carried away to some foul prison at the far ends of the earth, and there was nothing he could do to prevent it happening. Please, God, don't take her from me so soon, he prayed in despair. But the distant ship battled on through the storm, close-hauled, her captain trying to get clear of the deadly lee shore. Through the lens, Jim watched her with a seaman's eye. Tom had taught him well, and he understood all the forces and counter-forces of wind, keel, and sail. He saw how close to disaster she was hovering. The light strengthened, and even with the naked eye he could make out the detail of this dreadful contest of ship against storm. After another hour she was still locked in the bay, and Jim trained the telescope from the ship onto the black shark-like shape of Robin Island that guarded the exit. Every minute that passed made it more apparent that the Mew could not break out into the open sea on this tack. The captain would have to come about. He had no alternative. The bottom under him was already too deep for him to drop anchor again, and the storm was pushing him down inexorably onto the rocks of the island. If he went aground there, the hull would be smashed to splinters. "'Go about!' Jim jumped to his feet. "'Tack now! You're going to murder them, you idiot!' He meant both the ship and the girl. He knew that Louisa would still be battened down below, and even if by some miracle she escaped from the gun deck, the chains around her ankles would drag her under as soon as she went over the side. Doggedly the ship held her course. The manoeuvre of bringing such an ungainly ship about in the weather would entail terrible risk, but soon the captain must realise that no other course lay open to him. "'It's too late!' Jim agonised. "'It's already too late!' Then he saw it begin to happen, the sails slanting and their silhouette altering as she turned her head to the storm. He watched her through the lens, his hand shaking as her turn slowed. At last she hung there, caught in stays, with all her sails flogging and hammering, unable to complete the turn onto the other tack. Then Jim saw the next squall bearing down on her. The sea boiled at the foot of the racing curtain of rain and wind, which caught her and laid the ship over until her bottom planking showed, thick and filthy with weed and barnacles. Then the squall smothered her. She was gone, as though she had never existed. In anguish, Jim watched for her to reappear. She might have turned turtle to float keel uppermost, or she might even have been trodden right under. There was no way for him to know. His eye burned and his vision blurred with the intensity of his stare through the lens of the telescope. It seemed to take an age for the squall to pass. Then, abruptly, the ship appeared again, but it seemed that it could not be the same vessel. So drastically had her silhouette altered. Dismasted, Jim groaned. Though tears brought on by strain and wind ran through his cheeks, he could not take his eye from the lens. Main and fore, she's lost both masts. Only the mizzen poked up from the rolling hull and the tangle of sails and masts hanging over her side, barely slowed her as she paid off before the wind. It swept her back into the bay, clear of the rocks of Robin Island, but straight towards the thundering surf on the beach below where Jim stood. Swiftly, Jim calculated the distance, angles, and speed. "'She'll be on the beach in less than an hour,' he whispered to himself. "'God help all those on board when she strikes!' He lowered the telescope and, with the back of his arm, wiped the wind tears from his cheek. "'And most of all, God help Louisa!' 
He tried to imagine the conditions on the gun deck of the Mew at that moment, but his imagination balked. Louisa had not slept all that night. For hour after hour, while the Mew rolled and surged and snubbed against her anchor cable, and the storm howled relentlessly through the rigging, she had crouched under the gun carriage, working away with the file. She had padded the chain links with the canvas bag to deaden the scraping sound of metal against metal, but the file handle had raised a blister in her palm. When it burst, she had to use the bag to cushion the raw flesh. The first pale light of dawn showed through the chink in the port lid, and there was only a thin sliver of metal holding the chain link when she lifted her head and heard the unmistakable sounds of the anchor cable being hauled in, the stamp of the bare feet of the sailors working at the windlass on the deck above her. Then, faintly, she heard the shouted orders of the officers on the main deck and the rush of feet to the masts as men went aloft in the storm. "'We're sailing!' The word was passed along the gun deck, and women cursed their misfortune, or shouted abuse at the captain and his crew on the deck above, or at God, as their mood dictated. The respite was over. All the tribulations of making passage in this hell ship were about to begin again. They felt the altered motion of the hull as the anchor flukes broke out of the mud bottom, and the ship came alive to begin her struggle with the raging elements. A dark, bitter anger swept over Louisa. Salvation had seemed so close. She crept to the chink in the port lid. The light was too poor, and the spray and rain were too thick to allow her more than a dim glimpse of the distant land. It is still close, she told herself. By God's grace I might reach it. But in her heart she knew that across those miles of storm-driven sea the shore was far beyond her reach. Even if she managed to shed her leg-irons, climb out through the gun-port and leap overboard, there was no chance of her surviving more than a few minutes before she was driven under. She knew that Jim Courtney could not be there to rescue her. Better to go quickly by drowning, she told herself, than to rot away in this lice-infested hell. Frenziedly, she soared at the last sliver of steel that held the chain-link closed. Around her, the other prisoners were screaming and howling as they were thrown about mercilessly. Close hauled against the gale, the ship pitched and rolled wildly. Louisa forced herself not to look up from her work. Just a few strokes more of the file, the link parted, and her chains fell to the deck. Louisa wasted only a minute to massage her swollen, galled ankles. Then she crawled back under the cannon and took out the horn-handled knife from where she had hidden it. "'Nobody must try to stop me,' she whispered grimly. She crawled back to the gun port and prized loose the shackle of the lock. Then she tucked the knife into the pouch under her skirt. She wedged her back against the gun carriage and tried to force open the port lid. The ship was on the starboard tack, and the heel of the deck was against her. With all her strength behind it, she could push the heavy port lid open only a few inches, and when she achieved this, a solid jet of salt water spurted through the crack. She had to let it slam closed again. "'Help me! Help me get the port lid open!' she called desperately to her three allies among the prisoners. They stared back at her with dull, bovine expressions. They would rouse themselves to help her only if their own survival depended on it. Between waves, Louisa stole another quick glance through the chink of the port lid and saw the dark shape of the island not far ahead. We will be forced to tack now, she thought, or we will be driven aground. Over the months aboard, she had picked up a working knowledge and understanding of the ship's navigation and handling. On the other tack, I will have the heel of the hull to help me get it open. She crouched, ready and at last felt the bows coming up into the wind. The motion of the hull changed under her. Even above the keening of the wind she heard from the deck above the faint bellowing of orders and the running of frantic feet. She braced herself for the heel of the deck onto the opposite tack. But it did not happen, and the ship rolled with a heavy slack motion, dead in the water. One of the other prisoners, whose putative husband had been a boatswain on a VOC Indiaman, shouted with rising panic, "'Stupid pig of a captain as mist stays! Sweet Jesus, we're in irons!' Louisa knew what that meant. Head to the wind, the ship had lost her way through the water, and now she could not pay off on the other tack. She was pinned down helplessly before the storm. "'Listen!' the woman screamed. 
Then, above the din of the storm, they all heard it coming. Squall! She's going to lay us over! They crouched helplessly in their chains and listened to it grow louder. The shriek of the approaching squall deafened them, and when it seemed that it could not rise higher, it struck the ship. She reeled and staggered and went over like a bull elephant shot through the heart. They were stunned by the crackling uproar of breaking rigging, then the cannon shot of the mainstay parting under the strain. The howl went on over, until the gun deck was vertical, and tackle, gear, and human beings slid down the slope until they piled up against the hull. Loose iron cannonballs slammed into the piles of struggling prisoners. Women were shrieking with pain and terror. One of the iron balls came rolling down the slanting deck towards where Louisa clung to her gun carriage. At the last moment she threw herself aside, and the cannonball hit the woman who crouched beside her. Louisa heard the bones in both her legs shatter. The woman sat and stared at the tangle of her own limbs with an expression of astonishment. One of the great guns, nine tons of cast bronze, broke out of its tackle and came hurtling down the deck. It crushed the struggling women who lay in its path as though they were rabbits under the wheels of a chariot. Then it struck the hull. Even the massive oaken planking could not check its charge. It burst through and was gone. The sea poured through the splintered opening and swamped the gun deck under an icy green wave. Louisa held her breath and clung to the gun carriage as she was engulfed. Then she felt the howl begin to right itself as the squall raced past and relinquished its grip on the ship. The water poured out through the gaping hole in the side of the hull and sucked out a struggling, screaming knot of women. As they dropped into the sea, their chains dragged them under instantly. Still clinging to her gun carriage, Louisa could look out of the gaping wound in the ship's side as though it were an open doorway. She saw the broken mast, the tangled ropes and canvas hanging down into the churning water from the deck above. She saw the bobbing heads of the seamen who had been swept over the side with the wreckage. Then beyond it she saw the shore of Africa and the high surf bursting upon its beaches like volleys of cannon fire. The crippled ship was drifting down upon it, driven on by the gale. She watched the inexorable progress, terror mingled with burgeoning hope. With every second that passed, the shore was drawing closer, and the runaway cannon had smashed open an escape hatch for her. Even through the driving rain and spray, she could make out features on the shore, trees bending and dancing in the wind, a scattering of whitewashed buildings set back from the beach. Closer and closer the stricken ship drifted in, and now she could make out tiny human figures. They were coming from the town, scurrying along the edge of the beach, some waving their arms, but if they were shouting, their voices could not carry against that terrible wind. Now the ship was close enough for Louisa to tell the difference between man, woman and child in the gathering throng of spectators. It took an immense effort for her to force herself to leave her place of safety behind the gun carriage, but she began to crawl along the heaving deck over the shattered human bodies and sodden equipment. Cannonballs still rolled aimlessly back and forth, heavy enough to crush her bones, and she dodged those that trundled towards her. She reached the hole in the hull. It was wide enough for a horse to gallop through. She clung to the splintered planks and peered through the spray and the breaking surf at the beach. Her father had taught her to tread water and to swim in a doggy paddle in the lake at Moy Oitzch. With his encouragement as he swam beside her, she had once succeeded in crossing from one side of the lake to the other. This was different. She knew she could keep afloat only for a few seconds in this maelstrom of crazed surf. The shore was so close now that she could make out the expressions of the spectators who waited for the ship to strike. Some were laughing with excitement. Two or three children were dancing and waving their arms above their heads. None showed any compassion or pity for the death struggle of a great ship and the mortal predicament of those aboard her. For them this was a Roman circus, with the prospect of profit from salvaging the wreckage as it washed ashore. From the direction of the castle she saw a file of soldiers come down the beach at a dog trot. A mounted officer in a fine uniform was leading them. She could see his insignia glinting in his green and yellow jacket, even in this dull light. She knew that even if she succeeded in reaching the shore, the soldiers would be waiting for her. There was a fresh chorus of screams and heart-stopping cries from the women around her as they felt the vessel touch the bottom. 
The ship tore herself free and drifted on, only to touch again, the impact shivering the timbers of the hull. This time she stuck fast, pinned down on the sands, and the waves charged at her like rank after rank of a monstrous cavalry. The ship could not yield to their assault, and each wave struck with a malicious boom and a high white fountain of foam. Slowly the hull rolled over, and her starboard side came uppermost. Louisa scrambled out through the jagged opening. She stood upright on the high side of the heavily canted hull. The wind flung out her long yellow hair in a tangle and flattened the threadbare canvas shift against her thin body. The wet cloth emphasised the thrust of her breasts, which were full and round. She gazed towards the beach, saw the heads of the sailors who had abandoned the ship bobbing in the wild waters. One reached the shallows and stood up, only to be knocked flat by the next wave. Through the hole in the hull three other convicts followed her out but as they clung to the planking, their leg iron slowed their movements. Another wave swept the hull, and Louisa grabbed one of the shrouds from the mainmast, which dangled close by. The waters swirled round her waist, but she clung on. When the wave receded, all three of the other women were gone, drawn instantly under the green water by their chains. Using the shroud, Louisa pulled herself to her feet again. The spectators were galvanised by the sight of her, seemingly rising like Aphrodite from the waves. She was so young and lovely, and in such mortal danger. This was better than any flogging or execution on the parade ground of the castle. They danced and waved and shouted. Their voices were faint, but in the lull in the wind she could make out their cries. "'Jump, Macy! Swim! Let's see you swim! Better than a jail cell, Pushy!' She could see the sadistic excitement on their faces and hear the cruelty in their voices. She knew that there was no promise of help to be had from them. She raised her face to the sky, and at that moment a movement caught her eye. A horse and rider had appeared on the crest of the dune overlooking the stricken ship. The horse was a magnificent bay stallion. The rider sat astride the bare back. He had stripped off all his clothing except a breech-clout knotted round his waist. His torso was pale as porcelain but his strong young arms were tanned by the sun to the colour of fine leather, and his dense dark curls danced in the wind. He gazed back at her across the beach and the booming surf, and suddenly he raised his arm above his head and waved at her. Then she recognised him. Wildly she waved back and screamed his name, Jim! Jim Courtney! With mounting horror, Jim had watched the final moment of the Het Gelukkigemuur's agony. A few of the crew still huddled on the capsized hull. Then some of the female convicts were creeping out of the open gun ports and shattered hatches. The crowds on the beach taunted them as they clustered on the wave-swept hull. When a woman was washed overboard and her chains pulled her under, there was an ironic chorus of laughter and cheers from the spectators. Then the ship's keel struck the sand, and the impact hurled most of the convicts over the side. As the ship was rolled and pummeled onto the beach by the waves, the crew leapt from the heavily listing deck into the sea. The water overpowered most of them. One or two drowned bodies were washed up on the beach, and the spectators dragged them up above the high water mark. As soon as it was evident there was no life in them, they threw them into an untidy pile and ran back to join the sport. The first of the survivors waded out through the surf and fell on his knees in prayerful gratitude for his escape. Three convict women were thrown ashore, clinging to a spar from the shattered rigging. It had supported them, despite the weight of their chains. The soldiers from the castle rushed waist-deep into the creaming surf to drag them out onto the beach and arrest them. Jim saw that one was an obese creature with flaxen hair. White breasts the size of a pair of Zeelander cheeses bulged out of her torn shift. Struggling with her captors, she screamed an obscenity at Colonel Kaiser as he rode up. Kaiser leaned out of the saddle, lifted his sheathed sword, and struck her a blow with the scabbard that knocked her to her knees. But she was still shrieking as she looked up at him. There was a livid purple scar down her fat cheek. The next blow with the steel scabbard dropped her face down into the sand, and the soldiers dragged her away. Desperately, Jim searched the open deck for a glimpse of Louisa, but he could not find her. The hull dragged itself free of the sand and began once more to drift closer. 
Then she struck again solidly and began to roll over. The surviving women slid down the listing deck and one after another dropped over the side and splashed into the green water. The ship now lay on her side. There were no living souls clinging to the wreck. For the first time Jim saw the gaping hole through which the loose cannon had burst out. This opening was pointed to the sky, and suddenly a slim feminine form crawled out of it and came to her feet shakily on the rounded hull. Her long yellow hair was streaming with sea water and flapped heavily in the gale. Her tattered shift barely covered her coltish limbs. She might have been a boy, were it not for the full bosom under the rags. She gazed imploringly towards the crowds on the beach who jeered and mocked her. "'Jump, gallows bait!' they hooted. "'Swim! Swim for us, little fish!' Jim focused the telescope on her face, and it did not need the sapphire flash of blue from the eyes in her gaunt and pale face for him to recognise her. He sprang to his feet and ran down the back slope of the dune to where Drumfire stood patiently. He lifted his head and whinnied when he saw Jim coming. As he ran, Jim stripped off his clothing and left it strewn behind him. Hopping first on one leg and then the other, he pulled off his boots until he wore only his cotton breech clout. He reached the stallion's side, undid the girth, and let the saddle drop into the sand. Then he swung himself onto Drumfire's bare back, urged him up the slope, and halted him on the crest. He looked out with dread, that he might find that the girl had been washed off the wallowing hull. His spirits surged when he saw that Louisa was still perched there, as he had last seen her, but the ship was breaking up under the brutal hammer blows of the surf. He lifted his right arm high and waved at her. Her head jerked as she looked towards him, and he saw the moment that she recognised him. She waved back at him wildly, and although the wind smothered the sounds, she mouthed his name. Jim! Jim Courtney! Ha-ha! he called to Drumfire, and the stallion leapt forward down the slope of loose white sand, going back on his haunches to balance as they slid down the dune. They hit the beach at a gallop, and the crowd of onlookers scattered in front of Drumfire's flying hoofs. Kayser spurred his horse forward as if to intercept them. His plump, clean-shaven face was stern, and the ostrich feathers in his hat were blowing like the white surf. Jim touched Drumfire's flank with his toe, and the stallion swerved past the other horse, and they raced down towards the sea. A broken wave came tumbling to meet them, but its main force was spent. Without hesitation, Drumfire gathered his four feet under his chest and leapt over the leading edge of white water as though he were jumping a fence. When he splashed in on the other side, it was already too deep for his hooves to find the bottom. He began to swim, and Jim slid off his back and wove his fingers into the horse's mane. With his free hand on the stallion's neck, he guided him towards the wallowing wreck. Drumfire swam like an otter, his legs pumping in a mighty rhythm beneath the surface. He had gone twenty yards before the next tall wave struck and burst over them, submerging them. The girl on the wreck stared in horrified fascination, and even the watchers on the beach were silenced as they searched for a sign of them in the swirling aftermath of the wave's passage. Then a shout went up as their heads appeared through the foam. They had been washed back half the distance gained, but the stallion was swimming strongly, and the girl could hear him snorting the seawater from his nostrils with each breath. Jim's long black hair was sleek down his face and shoulders. She could hear his cries faint in the thunder of waters. Come, drumfire! Ha! Ha! They swam on through the icy green seas, swiftly making up the distance lost. Another wave came in but they swam up and over the crest, and now they were almost halfway across the gap between shore and ship. The girl stood up and balanced precariously on the heaving hull, gathering herself for the leap over the side. No! Jim yelled up at her. Not yet! Wait! He had seen the next wave humping up against the horizon. This one dwarfed all those that had come before it. Its cliff-like face seemed to be carved from solid green malachite, laced with white spume. As it came on in ponderous majesty, it blocked out half of the sky. "'Hold hard, Louisa!' Jim shouted, as the mighty wave crashed into the ship and smothered her. It left her submerged in its wake. Then it gathered itself again like a predator pouncing on its prey. For long seconds, horse and rider swam up its curling front. They were a pair of insects trapped on a wall of green glass. 
Then the face of the wave toppled forward, curling over them and falling in a solid avalanche as it crashed down on itself with such weight and power that the men on the beach felt the earth jump beneath their feet. Horse and rider were gone, driven so deeply under that surely they could never surface again. The watchers, who only seconds before had clamoured to see the storm prevail and its victims perish, now stood smitten with dread, waiting for the impossible to happen, for the heads of that gallant horse and his rider to reappear through the wild surf. Then the water subsided around the ship, and as it poured away they saw the girl still lying on the hull, the loose ropes of the rigging holding her from being sucked over the side. She lifted her head, and with the water streaming from her long hair, searched desperately for any sign of horse and man. The seconds drew on and became minutes. Another wave crashed in, then another. But they were not as high and powerful as the one that had buried horse and rider. Louisa felt despair settle on her. It was not for herself that she feared. She knew she was about to die, but her own life did not seem to matter any more. Instead, she grieved for the young stranger who had given his own trying to save her. Jim, she pleaded, please don't die. As if in response to her call, the two heads burst out through the surface. The undertow of the great wave that had pinned them under had also sucked them back almost to where they had disappeared. "'Jim!' she screamed, and leapt to her feet. He was so close that she could see the agony that contorted his face in the effort to draw breath. But he looked up at her and tried to say something. Perhaps it was a farewell. But then she knew in her heart that this was not a man who would ever surrender, not even to death. He was trying to shout a command, but his breath only whistled and gurgled in his throat. The horse was swimming again, but when it tried to turn its head back towards the beach, she saw Jim's hand in its mane guided back towards her. Jim was still choking and could not use his voice, but he made a gesture with his free hand, and now he was close enough for her to see the determination in his eyes. "'Jump!' she shouted against the wind. "'Shall I jump?' He nodded his sodden curls emphatically, and she could just make out the hoarse croak of his voice. "'Come!' She glanced over her shoulder and saw that even in his distress he had picked the slack between the waves to call her on. She threw aside the piece of rope that had saved her, took three running strides across the shattered deck, and leapt over the side with her shift ballooning around her waist and her arms windmilling. She hit the water and went under to reappear almost immediately. She struck out the way her father had taught her and swam to meet them. Jim reached out and seized her wrist. His grip was so powerful that she thought it might crush her bones, and after what she had suffered at Heus Brabant, she had thought that she would never allow a man to touch her again. But there was no time to think of that now. The next wave broke over her head, but his grip never slackened. They came up again, and she was spluttering and gasping for breath, yet she seemed to feel strength flowing into her through his fingers. He guided her hand to the horse's mane, and now he had recovered some of his voice. "'Don't hamper him!' She understood what he meant, for she knew horses. She tried not to put her weight on the stallion's back, but to swim beside him. Now they were heading towards the beach, and each wave that came up behind them carried them forward. Louisa heard voices, faint at first, but growing louder every second. The spectators on the beach were caught up in the excitement of the rescue, and fickle as any mob, they were cheering them on. They all knew this horse. Most of them had seen him win on Christmas Day. Jim Courtney was a well-known figure in the town. Some envied him as the son of a rich man. Some thought him too brash, but they all were forced to pay him respect. This was a famous battle he was waging against the sea, and most of them were sailors. Their hearts went out to him. Courage, Jim! Power to you, lad! Good on you! Swim, Jim boy, swim! Drumfire had felt the shore shelving under his hoofs and lunged forward powerfully. By now Jim had recovered his breath and coughed most of the water out of his lungs. He threw one leg over the stallion's back. As soon as he was astride, he reached down and pulled Louisa up behind him. She wrapped both arms around his waist and hung on with all her strength. Drumfire burst out of the shallows, water exploding before his charge, and then they were out on the beach. 
Jim saw Colonel Kayser galloping to intercept them and urged Drumfire into full stride, swinging his head away until Kayser was trailing twenty strides behind. Vach, you donder! Wait! She has an escaped prisoner! Hand the cow over to the law! I will deliver her to the castle myself, Jim yelled, without looking back. No, no, you don't! She's mine! Bring the bitch back! Kieser's voice was thick with fury. As Jim urged Drumfire on down the beach, he was determined on one thing only. He had already chanced too much ever to turn this girl over to anyone in the garrison, and in particular to Kieser. He had watched too many of the floggings and executions on the parade ground outside the castle walls over which Kieser had presided. Jim's own great-grandfather had been tortured and executed on that very ground after being falsely convicted of piracy on the high seas. "'They aren't going to get this one,' he swore grimly. Her thin arms were clasped round his waist, and he could feel the length of her body pressed against his naked back. Although she was half-starved, wet and shivering with the cold of the green waters and the wind of drumfire's speed, he could sense the courage and determination in her which matched his own. "'She's a fighter, this one. I can never let her down,' he thought, and called back to her, "'Hold tight, Louisa, we're going to run the fat colonel into the dirt!' Though she did not answer, and he could hear her teeth chattering, she tightened her grip around him and crouched low. He could feel by her balance and the way she adjusted to Drumfire's motion that she was a horsewoman. He glanced back under his arm and saw that they had opened the gap on Kieser. Jim had raced against Trofart before— and he knew the mare's best points and her weaknesses. She was quick and game, as her name, True Heart, suggested, but Kieser overburdened her light frame. On firm, smooth going, she was in her element, and she probably had the legs of drum fire out in the open, but on this soft beach sand, or over rock and other heavy going, drum fire's great strength gave him the advantage. Although the stallion was carrying a double load, Louisa was light as a sparrow, and Jim was not as heavily built as the colonel. Yet Jim knew better than to underestimate the mare. He knew she had the heart of a lioness, and had almost run drumfire down over the last half-mile of the Christmas racing. I must pick the course to our advantage, he decided. He had ridden every inch of the ground between here and the foothills, and knew every hill and marsh, salt pan and patch of forest where true heart would be at a disadvantage. Stop, young'un, or I will shoot! There was another shout behind and when Jim looked back, Kieser had drawn the pistol from the holster on the front of his saddle and was leaning out to avoid hitting his own horse. In that swift glance, Jim saw that it was a single-barreled weapon, and there was not a second in the holster. Jim swerved drumfire to the left without a break in his stride, cutting sharply across the mare's nose. In an instant he had changed Kieser's target from a steady, going-away shot to one with a sharp angle of deflection. Even an experienced soldier like the colonel, shooting from a galloping horse, would have difficulty judging the forward allowance. Jim reached back, seized Louisa around the waist, and swung her round on his offside, tucking her under his armpit and shielding her with his own body. The pistol shot boomed out, and he felt the strike of the heavy ball. It was high in his back across his shoulders, but after the numbing shock his arms were still strong and his senses alert. He knew he was not badly wounded. Only prick me, he thought. And then he spoke. That's his one and only shot, he said to encourage Louisa, and swung her back into her place behind him. Mercy, you're hit, she exclaimed fearfully. Blood was streaming down his back. We'll worry about that later, he sang out. Now Drumfire and I are going to show you a few of our tricks. He was enjoying himself. He had just been half drowned and shot but he was still cocky. Louisa had found herself an indomitable champion, and her spirit soared. But they had lost ground with that evasive turn, and close behind they heard Trueheart's hooves slapping into the sand and the scraping of steel in the scabbard as Kieser drew his sabre. Louisa glanced back and saw him rise up over her, standing in the stirrups with his blade held high, but the change of his balance wrong-footed the mare, and she stumbled. Kieser swayed and grabbed at the pommel of his saddle to regain balance, and Drumfire pulled ahead. Jim put him at the slope of the high dune, and here the stallion's great strength came into play. 
He went up in a series of violent lunges, with the sand spurting out from under his hoofs. Trueheart dropped back sharply as she carried the colonel's weight up the slope. They went over the top and slid down the far side. From the foot of the dune there was open ground and firm going to the edge of the lagoon. Louisa looked back. They are gaining again, she warned Jim. Trueheart was striding out gracefully. Even though she was carrying the weight of the colonel and all his weapons and accoutrement, she seemed to flirt with the earth. He's reloading his pistol. There was an edge of alarm in her voice. Kieser was ramming a ball into the muzzle. Let's see if we can wet his powder for him, Jim said, and they reached the edge of the lagoon and plunged in without a check. Swim again, Jim ordered and Louisa slipped into the water on Drumfire's other flank. They both looked back as Trueheart reached the edge of the lagoon, and Kieser pulled her up. He jumped down and primed the pan of his pistol. Then he cocked the hammer and aimed at them across the open water. There was a puff of white gun smoke. A fountain of water jumped from the surface an arm's length behind them, and with a hum the heavy ball ricocheted over their heads. "'Now throw your boots at us!' Jim laughed, and Kieser stamped with rage. Jim hoped that he would give up now. Surely, even in his anger, he must consider the fact that Trueheart was so heavily burdened, while they were almost naked, and Drumfire's back was bare. Kieser made the decision and swung up onto the mare's back. He pushed her into the water just as Drumfire emerged onto the muddy bank on the far side. Immediately Jim turned him parallel to the shore, and, keeping to the soft ground, led him along the shore at a trot. "'We must give Drumfire a chance to breathe,' he told Louisa, as she ran behind him. "'That swim out to the ship would have drowned any other horse.' He was watching their pursuers. Trueheart was only halfway across the lagoon. Kieser wasted time with his pistol practice. "'One thing is certain.' There'll be no more of that. His powder is well and truly soaked by now. The water washed the blood from your wound, she told him, reaching out to touch his back lightly. I can see now it's a graze. Not deep, thank the good Lord. It's you we have to worry about, he said. Your skin and bones, not a pound of meat on you. How long can you run on those skinny legs? As long as you can, she flared at him, and angry red spots appeared on her pale cheeks. He grinned at her unrepentantly. "'You may have to prove that boast before this day is done. Kaiser is a cross.' Far behind them, Trueheart came onto the bank, and streaming water from his tunic, breeches and boots, Kaiser mounted her and set out along the bank after them. He urged the mare into a gallop, but heavy clods of mud flew from her hoofs, and it was immediately obvious that she was making heavy work of it. Jim had kept to the mud flats for just that reason to test Trueheart's strength. "'Up you get!' Jim seized Louisa, threw her up onto the stallion's back, and broke into a run. He kept a firm grip on Drumfire's mane, so he was pulled along, keeping pace with the horse's easy canter while saving the animal's strength. He kept glancing back to judge their relative speeds. He could afford to let Kaiser gain a little ground now. Carrying only Louisa's weight, Drumfire was going easily while the mare was burning up her strength in this reckless pursuit. Within half a mile, Kaiser's weight began to tell, and Trueheart slowed to a walk. She was still trailing by half a pistol shot. Jim slowed to her speed to keep the gap constant. "'Come down, if you please, your ladyship,' he told Louisa. "'Give drum fire another breather.' She jumped down lightly, but flashed at him. "'Don't call me that!' It was a bitter reminder of the taunts she had endured from her fellow convicts. "'Perhaps we should rather call you Hedgehog,' he asked. "'The Lord knows you have prickles enough to warrant it.' "'Kaiser must be almost exhausted by now,' Jim thought, "'for he stayed in the saddle, not taking his weight off his mount. "'They're almost done in,' he told Louisa. "'He knew that not far ahead, and still on the Courtney estate, "'lay a salt pan that they called Grootwit.' Big White. That was where he was leading Kaiser. He's coming on again, Louisa warned him, and he saw that Kaiser was pushing the mare into a canter. She was a game little filly, and she was responding to the whip. Mount, he ordered. I can run as far as you can, she shook the salt crusted tangle of her long hair at him defiantly. 
"'In Jesus' name, woman, must you always argue? "'Must you always blaspheme?' she reposted. "'But she allowed him to hoist her onto the stallion's back. "'They ran on. "'Within the mile, True Heart had slowed to a walk, "'and they could do the same. "'There's the beginning of the salt,' Jim pointed ahead, "'and even under the low storm clouds and in the gathering dusk, "'it shone like a vast mirror. "'It looks flat and hard.' She shaded her eyes against the glare. It looks that way, but under the crust it's porridge. With the great fat Dutchman and all his equipment up on her back, the mare will break through every few paces. It's almost three miles across the pan. They will be completely finished before they reach the other side. And, he looked at the sky, by then it will be dark. Although it was hidden by the lowering blanket of cloud, the sun must have been close to the horizon, and the darkness was coming on. As Jim led Drumfire, the girl staggering beside him off the treacherous white plain. He paused at the edge of the forest, and they both looked back. Like a long string of black pearls, Drumfire's hoofprints were deeply scored into the smooth white surface. Even for him, the crossing had been a terrible ordeal. Far behind they could just make out the small, dark shape of the mare. Two hours earlier, with Kaser on her back, Trueheart had broken through the salt crust and into the quicksand beneath. Jim had stopped and watched Kaser struggle to free her. He had been tempted to turn back and help them. She was such a game, beautiful animal, and he could not bear to watch her bogged down and exhausted. Then he remembered that he was unarmed and almost naked, while Kaiser had his sabre and was a swordsman to be reckoned with. Jim had watched him leading his cavalry troop through their evolutions on the parade ground outside the castle. While he hesitated, Kaiser had managed by force to drag the mare free of the mud and continue plodding in pursuit. Now he was still following, and Jim frowned. If there were ever a time to meet Kaiser, it would be when he comes off the salt— he would be exhausted, and in the dark I would have the benefit of surprise. But he has his sabre, and I have nothing, he murmured. Louisa looked at him for a moment, then turned her back to him modestly and reached under the skirt of her shift. She found the horn-handled clasp-knife in the pouch she wore strapped around her waist and handed it to him without a word. He stared at it in astonishment, then burst out laughing as he recognised it. I withdraw everything I said about you. You look like a Viking maid, and but Jesus, you act like one too. Watch your blaspheming tongue, Jim Courtney, she said. But there was no fire in the rebuke. She was too tired to argue further, and the compliment had been a pretty one. As she turned away her head, there was a weary half-smile on her lips. Jim led drumfire into the trees, and she followed them. After a few hundred paces in a spot where the forest was thickest, he tethered the stallion and told Louisa, "'Now you can rest a while.' This time she did not protest, but sank down on the thick leaf mould on the forest floor, curled up, closed her eyes. In her weakened state she felt that she might never have the strength to stand up again. Hardly had the thought flashed through her mind than she was asleep. Jim wasted a few moments admiring her suddenly serene features. Until then he had not realised how young she was. Now she looked like a sleeping child. While he watched her, he opened the blade of the knife and tested the point on the ball of his thumb. At last he tore himself away and ran back to the edge of the forest. Keeping well hidden, he peered out across the darkening salt pan. Kaysra was still coming on doggedly, leading the mare. "'Will he never give up?' Jim wondered, and felt a twinge of admiration for him. Then he looked around for the best place to hide beside the tracks that Drumfire had left. He picked a patch of dense bush, crept into it, and squatted there with the knife in his hand. Kaysera reached the edge of the pan and staggered out onto the firm footing. By this time it was so dark that although Jim could hear him panting for breath, he was just a dark shape. He came on slowly, leading the mare, and Jim let him pass his hiding place. Then he slipped out of the bush and crept up behind him. Any sound he might have made was covered by the hoof falls of the mare. From behind he locked his left arm around Kaser's throat, and at the same time pressed the point of the knife into the soft skin under his ear. "'I will kill you if you force me to,' he snarled, making his tone ferocious. Kaser froze with shock. Then he regained his own voice. 
You can't hope to get away with this, Courtney. There's no place for you to run. Give me the woman and I will settle things with your father and Governor van der Witten. Jim reached down and drew the sabre from the scabbard on the colonel's belt. Then he released his lock around the man's throat and stepped back. But he held the point of the sabre to Kayser's chest. Take off your clothes, he ordered. You are young and stupid, Courtney, Kayser replied coldly. I will try to make allowances for that. Tunic first, Jim ordered, then breeches and boots. Kayser did not move. Jim pricked his chest, and at last, reluctantly, the colonel reached up and began to unbutton his tunic. What do you hope to achieve? he asked, as he shrugged out of it. Is this some boyish notion of chivalry? The woman is a convicted felon. She is probably a whore and a murderess. Say that again, Colonel, and I'll spit you like a sucking pig. This time Jim drew blood with the point. Kayser sat down to pull off his boots and his breeches. Jim stuffed them into Trueheart's saddlebags. Then, with the point of the sabre at the man's back, he escorted Kayser, barefoot and wearing only his undershirt, to the edge of the salt pan. "'Follow your own tracks, Colonel,' he told him, "'and you should be back at the castle in time for breakfast.' "'Listen to me, young un, Kayser said in a thin, tight voice. "'I will come after you. "'I will see you hanged on the parade, "'and I promise you it will be slow, very slow. "'If you stand here talking, Colonel, "'you're going to miss your breakfast.' "'Jim smiled at him. "'You'd far better start walking.' "'He watched Kayser trudge away across the salt pan. "'Suddenly the heavy clouds were stripped away by the wind "'and the full moon burst through to light the pale surface "'as though it were day. "'It was bright enough to throw a shadow at Kayser's feet. "'Jim watched him until he was only a dark blob in the distance "'and knew that he was not coming back. "'Not tonight, at least.' "'But it's not the last we've seen of the gallant colonel,' he thought. "'We can be sure of that.' "'Then he ran back to Trueheart and led her into the forest. "'He shook Louisa awake. "'Wake up, hedgehog. "'We have a long journey ahead of us,' he told her. "'And by this time tomorrow we are going to have Kayser "'and a squadron of cavalry in full cry after us.' "'When she sat up groggily, he went to Trueheart.' A rolled woolen cavalry cloak was strapped on top of Kayser's saddlebags. "'It will be cold when we get into the mountains,' he warned her. She was still half asleep and did not protest as he wrapped the cloak around her shoulders. Then he found the colonel's food bag. It held a loaf of bread, a wedge of cheese, a few apples and a flask of wine. The colonel dearly loves his food. He tossed her an apple, and she wolfed it down, core and all. "'Sweeter than honey,' she said through a mouthful. I never tasted anything like it before. Greedy little hedgehog, he teased her, and this time she gave him an urchin smile. Most people found it hard to be angry with Jim for long. He squatted on his haunches in front of her, and with the clasp knife cut a hunk of bread and slapped a thick slice of cheese on top of it. She ate with ferocious intensity. He watched her pale face in the moonlight. She looked like a pixie. "'Aren't you?' she asked. "'Aren't you eating?' "'He shook his head. "'He had decided that there would not be enough for both of them. "'This girl was starving. "'How did you learn to speak such good English? "'My mother came from Devon. "'My oath! "'That's where we're from. "'My great-great-grandfather was a duke or, or something of that ilk. "'So shall I call you duke? "'That will do until I think of something better, hedgehog.' She took another bite of bread and cheese, so she could not reply. While she ate, he sorted through the rest of Kayser's possessions. He tried on the gold frog tunic and held the lapels together. Space for two of us in here, but it's warm. The front flaps of the colonel's breeches went halfway again around Jim's middle, but he belted them with one of the straps from the saddlebags. Then he tried the boots. At least these are a good fit. "'In London I saw a play called The Tin Soldier,' she said. "'That's who you look like now.' "'You were in London?' "'Despite himself, he was impressed. "'London was the centre of the world. "'You must tell me about it as soon as we have an opportunity.' "'Then he led the horses to the well on the edge of the pan "'where the cattle were watered. "'He and Mansur had dug it themselves two years ago. "'The water in it was sweet.' 
and the horses drank thirstily. When he led them back, he found Louisa had fallen asleep again under the cloak. He squatted beside her and studied her face in the moonlight, and there was a strange hollow feeling under his ribs. He left her to sleep a little longer and went to feed the horses from the colonel's grain bag. Then he selected what he needed from Kaiser's equipment. The pistol was a lovely weapon, and tucked into the leather holster was a small canvas roll that contained the ramrod and all the accessories. The sabre was of the finest steel. In the tunic he found a gold watch and a purse filled with silver guilders and a few gold ducats. In the back pocket there was a small brass box that contained a flint and steel and cotton kindling. If I steal his horse I might as well take the money too, he told himself. However, he drew the line at filching Kaiser's more personal possessions, so he placed the gold watch and the medals in one of the saddlebags and left it lying conspicuously in the centre of the clearing. He knew that Kaiser would return here tomorrow with his bushman trackers and would find his personal treasures. I wonder how grateful he will be for my generosity, he smiled bleakly. He was carried along by a sense of reckless inevitability. He knew that there was no turning back. He was committed. He went to resaddle Trueheart, then squatted beside Louisa. She was curled into a ball under the cloak. He stroked her hair to wake her gently. She opened her eyes and looked up at him. "'Don't touch me like that,' she whispered. "'Don't ever touch me like that again.' Her voice was filled with such bitter loathing that he recoiled. Years ago Jim had captured a wild cat kitten. Despite all his loving patience, he had never been able to tame the creature. It snarled and bit and scratched. In the end he had taken it out into the felt and set it free. Perhaps this girl was like that. I had to wake you, he said. We must go on. She stood up immediately. Take the mare, he said. She has a soft mouth and a gentle nature, yet she is as fast as the wind. Her name is Trueheart. He boosted her into the saddle, and she took the reins and wrapped the cloak tightly around her shoulders. He handed her the last of the bread and cheese. You can eat as we go. She ate as though she was still famished, and he wondered what terrible privations she had been forced to endure that had turned her into the starved, abused wild creature. He felt a fleeting doubt at his own ability to help or redeem her. He thrust it aside and smiled at her in what he imagined was a placatory way, but which to her seemed merely supercilious. When we get to Majuba, Zama will have the hunter's pot going. I hope he's filled it to the brim. I'd place money on you in an eating contest with the good colonel. He sprang up on Drumfire's back. First, though, we have something else to do here. He set off at a trot in the direction of High Weald, but he circled well clear of the homestead. By now it was after midnight, but still he did not want to chance running into his father or Uncle Dorian. The news of his escapade would have reached their ears almost as soon as he had plucked the girl out of the sea. He had seen many of the family freed slaves and servants among the spectators on the beach. He could not face his father now. We'll get no sympathy there, he thought. He'll try to force me to turn Louisa over to the colonel. He rode instead to a cluster of huts at the east side of the paddock. He dismounted in a stand of trees and handed Drumfire's reins to Louisa. Stay here. I won't be long. He approached the largest mud-walled hut in the village carefully and whistled. There was a long pause. Then a lantern flared behind the uncured sheepskin that covered the single window in place of a curtain. The reeking fleece was drawn aside, and a dark head poked out suspiciously. Who's there? Bucket, it's me. Somoya. He came out into the moonlight with a greasy blanket tucked around his waist. He was as tiny as a child, his skin amber in the moonlight. His features were flattened, and his eyes had a curious Asiatic slant. He was a bushman and he could track a lost beast for fifty leagues over desert and mountain through blizzard and storm. He smiled up at Jim, and his eyes were almost hidden in a web of wrinkles. May the Kulu Kulu smile upon you, Somoya. And on you also, old friend. 
Call out all the other shepherds. Gather up the herds and drive them over every road, especially all the paths heading towards the east and north. I want them to chop up the ground until it looks like a ploughed field. Nobody must be able to follow my tracks when I leave here, not even you. Do you understand? Bakat cackled with laughter. Ah, <laughs> oh, yeah, Samoya, I understand very well. We all saw the fat soldier chasing you when you ran off with that pretty little girl. Don't worry, by morning there won't be a single one of your tracks left for him to follow. Good fellow, Jim clapped him on the back. I'm off. I know where you are going. You are taking the robber's road, huh? The robber's road was the legendary escape route out of the colony, travelled only by fugitives and outlaws. Nobody knows where it leads because nobody ever comes back. The spirits of my ancestors whisper to me in the night, and my soul pines for their wild places. Do you have a place for me at your side? Jim laughed. Follow and be welcome, Bakat. I know that you'll be able to find me wherever I go. You could follow the tracks of a ghost over the burning rocks of hell, but first do what you must do here. Tell my father I am well. Tell my mother I love her, he said, and ran back to where Louisa and the horses were still waiting. They went on. The storm had blown itself out. The wind had dropped, and the moon was low in the west before they reached the foothills. He stopped beside a stream that ran down from the hills. We'll rest and water the horses, he told her. He did not offer to help her dismount, but she dropped to the ground as lithely as a cat and took true heart to drink at the pool. She and the mare seemed already to have established an accord. Then she went into the bushes on her own. He wanted to call after her and warn her not to go far, but he held back the words. The colonel's wine flask was half empty. Jim smiled as he shook it. Kaser must have been nipping at it since breakfast time yesterday, he thought, and went to the pool to dilute what remained with the sweet mountain water. He heard the girl come back through the bushes, and still hidden from him by a pile of tall rocks, go down to the water. There was a splash. Damn me, if the madwoman's not taking a bath! He shook his head and shivered at the thought. There was still snow on the mountains, and the night air was chill. When Louisa returned, she sat on one of the rocks at the edge of the pool, not too close to him, nor again too far away. Her hair was wet, and she combed it out. He recognised the tortoise-shell comb. He went over to her and passed her the wine flask. She paused long enough to drink from it. Ah, oh, that's good, she said it like a peace offering, then went on combing the pale hair that reached almost to her waist. He watched her quietly, but she did not look in his direction again. A fishing owl darted down to the pool on silent wings, like a gigantic moth. Hunting only by the last rays of the moon, it snatched a small yellow fish from the waters and flew with it to a branch of the dead tree on the far bank. The fish flapped in its talons as the owl tore chunks of meat out of its back. Louisa looked away. When she spoke again, her voice was soft and the faint accent appealing. Don't think I'm not grateful for what you have done for me. I know you have risked your life and maybe more than that to help me. Well, you must understand that I, I keep a menagerie of pets, he spoke lightly. I needed only one more to add to it. A small hedgehog. Perhaps you have the right to call me that, she said, and sipped from the flask again. You know nothing about me. Things have happened to me, things that you could never understand. I know a little about you. I have seen your courage and your determination. I saw what it was like, and how it smelt on board the Mew. Perhaps I might understand, he replied. At least I would try. He turned to her, then felt his heart break as he saw the tears running down her cheeks, silver in the moonlight. He wanted to rush to her and hold her tightly but he remembered what she had said. Never touch me like that again. Instead, he said, Whether you like it or not, I'm your friend. I want to understand. She wiped her cheeks with the palm of one small dainty hand and sat huddled, thin, pale and disconsolate in the cloak. There's just one thing I must know, Jim said. I have a cousin called Mansur. 
he is closer to me than a brother could be. He said that perhaps you are a murderess. That burns my soul. I must know. Are you? Is that why you were on the mew? She turned slowly towards him, and with both hands parted the curtain of her damp hair, so that he could see her face. My father and mother died of the plague. I dug their graves with my own hands. I swear to you, Jim Courtney, on my love for them, and on the graves in which they lie, that I am no murderess. He heaved a great sigh of relief. Ha! Ah, I believe you. You don't have to tell me anything else. She drank again from the flask, then handed it back to him. Don't let me have more. It softens my heart when I need to be strong, she said. They sat on in silence. He was just about to tell her that they must go on deeper into the mountains, when she whispered so quietly that he was not sure that she had spoken. There was a man, a rich and powerful man whom I trusted as once I trusted my dead father. He did things to me that he did not want other people to know about. No, Louisa. He held up his hand to stop her. Don't tell me this. I owe you my life and my freedom. You have a right to know. Please stop. He wanted to jump to his feet and run into the bushes to escape her words, but he could not move. He was held mesmerized by them, as a mouse by the swaying dance of the cobra. She went on in the same sweet, childlike tones. I will not tell you what he did to me. I will never tell anyone that. But I cannot let any man touch me again. When I tried to escape from him, he had his servants hide a packet of jewellery in my room. Then they called the watch to find it. They took me before the magistrate in Amsterdam. My accuser was not even in the courtroom when I was condemned to be transported for life. They were both silent for a long time. Then she spoke again. Now you know about me, Jim Courtney. Now you know that I am a soiled and discarded plaything. What do you want to do now? I want to kill him, said Jim at last. If ever I meet this man... I will kill him. I have spoken honestly to you. Now you must speak honestly to me. Be sure of what you want. I have told you that I will let no man touch me again. I have told you what I am. Do you want to take me back to Good Hope and hand me over to Colonel Kaiser? If you do, I am ready to go back with you. He did not want her to see his face. Not since he was a child had anyone seen him weep. He jumped to his feet and went to saddle Trueheart. Come, Hedgehog. It's a long ride to Majuba. We have no more time to waste in idle chatter. She came to him obediently and mounted the horse. He led her into the deep defile in the mountains and up the steep gorge. It grew colder as they climbed, and in the dawn... The sun lit the mountain tops with a weird pink light. Patches of old, unmelted snow gleamed among the rocks. It was late in the morning before they paused on the crest at the limit of the tree line and looked down into the hidden valley. There was a tumble down building among the rocks of the scree slope. She might not have noticed it were it not for the thin column of smoke rising from the hole in the tattered thatch roof and the small herd of mules in the stone walled kraal. Majuba, he told her, as he reined in. The place of the doves, and that is Zama. A tall young man dressed in a loincloth had come out into the sunlight and was staring up at them. We've been together all our lives. I think you'll like him. Zama waved and bounded up the slope to meet them. Jim slipped down from Drumfire's back to greet him. Have you got the coffee pot on? he asked. Zama looked up at the girl on the horse. They studied each other for a moment. He was tall and well-formed, with a broad, strong face and very white teeth. "'I see you, Miss Louisa,' he said at last. "'I see you also, Zama. But how did you know my name?' Samoya told me. "'How did you know mine?' 
He told me also. Here's a great chatterbox, is he not? she said, and they laughed together. But why do you call him Samoya? she asked. It is the name my father gave him. It means the wild wind, Zama replied. He blows as he pleases, like the wind. Which way will he blow now? she asked. But she was looking at Jim with a small, quizzical smile. Ha ha! We shall see, Zama laughed. But it will be the way we least expect. <laughs>